This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. And it's July 4th, and I'm Dan, alongside Matt, as always, and this is a bit of a different show. We're live from Windsport today on the first day of on-ice uh, training camp for the Flames Development Camp. Uh, Matt, b- before we get there, why don't we back up a couple days? You and I talked before July 1st about what might happen for free agency. Let's look back at what did happen. Okay. So the first thing we saw just before July 1st was the qualifying offers for our RFAs. And uh, the following players did not receive a qualifying offer from the Flames. I'll read through them all. Then you can tell me if anyone surprises you. Josh Healy, Curtis Lazar, Mason McDonald, Brett Pollock, and Kirby Reichel. Anyone you're surprised that didn't get an RFA? Uh, I'm a little tiny bit surprised about Mason McDonald, but again, not overly so. Uh, Curtis Lazar, I did not expect uh, him to be back. I think that they were... Trying to basically do him a favor, sort of in the same mold that they did with Brett Kulak, where we we're, we've parked you in the AHL, and you know if you get uh, no offers from anybody else, then you know we'll sign you to a two-way deal. If you listen to the team too, they were saying that they were a little worried about arbitration on uh, on Lazar, who's eligible for it. Yeah, and I don't think they wanted to go one way with him, and so. Th- it's like if you can get a one-way offer from somebody else, good for you, awesome, have fun. And he did with Buffalo, and if not, then come back and we'll uh, sign you for a two-way. And it, that did not come to pass. You and I talked last year about Mason McDonald and the fact he probably wouldn't be qualified. And if you look at the Flames' uh, blue or sorry net depth and the fact that they brought in uh, Zega Doolin from Russia – I really think there's nowhere for Mason right now. I think that looking at how Nick Schneider's season went last year, uh, I think Schneider is probably going to be your ECHL starter without a doubt. And I don't know where Mason fits. I mean, we've already got more goalies than we have spots at this point. I think it was just the Flames saying, you know what, let's, for both sides, let's go out, let's figure out what's out there, what we might want to, you know, maybe the Flames want to go in a different direction or maybe someone else wants to sign him. But I could see him coming back late even to an AHL or ECHL deal within this organization but I really think Schneider's overtaken him on the depth chart yeah and with goalies like I would not be surprised if Mason McDonald signs on with another team and then progresses potentially to being a viable prospect because he did make a fairly decent leap last year from the year before and that's why I was a little surprised that he got let go but it it's one of those things, as you said, we have a lot of depth right at this moment with the young goaltenders and not enough spots for them all. And we need to keep cycling goalies through. And, like, we drafted uh, Dustin Wolf, so it's we're getting more guys in the pipeline. And, you know, you just at times have to cut your weakest link, and McDonald was that, unfortunately for him. Um, and hopefully moving forward we can uh, – or w- for him that he can progress and maybe carve out a career in some fashion. Looking at the other two forwards, the other two left-wingers not qualified, Brett Pollock and Kirby Reichel. Uh, Pollock, you and I have seen here at the dev camp for a few years, he came over in that uh, Chris Russell trade, and he just – he never looked – the way he should, like when even when you and I looked at him, even after he turned pro and he'd been here, we said this guy doesn't look like a pro, and I'm not surprised the Flames didn't qualify him. I think that he's of that mold where there's a ton of guys out there that have some pro experience, probably never going to be an NHLer, and you know we can either find another one or with the number of guys we have turning pro this year, uh, replace him internally. Yeah, and when he was drafted, I remember writing up an article about him uh, when I was doing full-on draft previews and that, and like he was a fairly decent scorer in the dub, and then he just simply didn't progress at all beyond that point. And 
from the time he was drafted right forward, it, you saw virtually no improvement in his game, which is unusual because normally if you're that talented at the dub level and you're, you become a second-round pick, usually there's something there, and it's rare for that to be the person's ceiling, and unfortunately with Pollock, that was the case. And Reichel was good in – it's just that he's so – lacking in foot speed that that's the only reason why he's not a full-time NHLer. I think in the modern NHL it's going to be even five years ago I think Reichel could have found a spot on a fourth line or as the extra forward on a lot of teams I think right now you're right with his foot speed the way it is I think Reichel's probably destined to stay in the NHL. Well like if you look back to like even like say 2004 when the Flames ran to the finals uh, he his foot speed is very reminiscent of Chris Simon like just okay there and he probably would have had a solid nhl career because his size and physicality and his offensive talents he probably would have been a decent third fourth line guy much in the same mold as chris simon it's just that this nhl it, the it, the speed just is not there and unfortunately for him he was just came up at the wrong time I still think Reichel might be back um, either as a late signing or as an AHL signing because I think he is a useful AHL piece. Oh, I agree. And the AHL, you always need high-quality forwards, and Reichel is one. Well, not just high-quality forwards, guys that have been around for a while too and can play that veteran leader role. Uh, The last guy on this list, Josh Healy, a guy, again, we've seen here at Dev Camp for a number of years. I was never that high on him. I always felt like he was – they needed a defenseman, and he was the next guy who was good enough. Yeah. I'm not surprised to see Healy not qualified. Exactly. And with prospects like Healy, you just hope that they figure something out. And like uh, Pollock, he just really didn't progress from the time we signed him. So you try. You throw the dart at the board. Sometimes you hit it. Sometimes you don't. And with Healy, it not so much. And... You just go on to the next group. Well, talking about the next group, let's talk about uh, after July 1st, the Calgary Flames did make a number of signings. We'll talk about that next group of guys who are coming in, and then we'll say some goodbyes after that. Does that work for you? Perfect. Uh, the number one guy, I think the one that everyone knows, is the Calgary Flames, I guess, in their mind, solved their goaltender issue, uh, bringing in Cam Talbot, who you and I had speculated for a while that he might come here. Um, we think I still think of him as an Edmonton goalie, even though, as Brad said, our goalie's coming from Philadelphia. Yeah. He's an Edmonton goalie. Uh, yeah. Signed him to a one-year, $2.75 million deal. I'll give you my thoughts on this first. I think for one year, we've seen the Flames sign a lot of big, long-term, bad contracts July 1. I like this as a one-year deal. I agree. If he's really bad, you could probably waive him, put him down. But he's 31. He's still at the prime of his goalie career. I think even playing a, a you know a year like he had last year, He'll be a fine backup to play 25, 35 games somewhere in there. But I'm looking at this as a one-two tandem. And I am I think Talbot, one year, 2.75, he's betting on himself. Sign a one year, he's saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get better, and I'm going to get a great contract after that. And the fact he's betting on himself, I think we're going to see a bounce back. Uh, yeah, here. and him being highly motivated and plus signing with his former team's biggest rival, uh, that also helps to motivate yep. you. And you just look at the Edmonton Oilers and how they were composed as a team. And the goaltender had to be perfect for the Oilers pretty much at any game to have a shot at winning that game. And you saw him be a little mentally fragile last season where he allowed 13 goals on the first shot of the game because he was kind of psyching himself out because, oh, I can't let anything in. And then he proceeds to let things in. Well, I and think he's also playing behind a very poor defense. Exactly. So I think there was more and pressure on him. Yeah, exactly. And it's because of the lack of overall depth of the Oilers. Like, McDavid's great in that, but there's 17 other skaters, and, you know, they only have, like, three or four other guys that are high quality. It's hard for anybody else to be successful individually, and especially dumping that much responsibility on the goaltender. And to his credit, for the years prior, he was good enough where he dragged the Oilers to a playoff spot that one year and were respectable the year after. But it, the pressure just got to him as the Oilers continued to get worse and worse. 
I think Talbot behind a good Calgary Flames defense like we saw this year is really going to help his game. I think he'll bounce back to about his career average, even if he can do a .91, even .90 save percentage as a, you know, a tandem guy. I think it would be okay, but I think, you know, he can definitely bounce back to a 9-2, 9-3, somewhere in there. And behind our defense, I really like this signing. Well, you look at the, how bad, frankly, the Flames goaltending was this past season. Like, Mike Smith was horrible. And uh, you, except for the playoffs, and Riddick for a good portion of the season, the latter part of the season was not very good either. So if Talbot comes in and is even just a league average goaltender, or even a slightly below average league goaltender, that is a massive upgrade to what we had last season. And like the Flames were already a hundred and seven point team. And if they get even just remotely competent goaltending from their tandem of Riddick and Talbot, that'll make their whole lives a heck of a lot easier. Doesn't this goalie move almost feel like a trade that Mike Smith goes to Edmonton and Talbot comes to Calgary? Like, every time I look at him, I'm like, we traded goalies with Edmonton. That's the yeah. way my mind goes. Yeah, and honestly, I, I am actually of the opinion that Mike Smith will have a better season next year. Because he tends to play better when he's getting shelled. He all does the time. good and he gets a lot of rubber. And you look at the playoffs; he w- was fantastic because the Flames were terrible. <laughs> I and would just because I want to stick it to the Oilers. I would love to see them pay Koskinen four million dollars to back up Smith. Yeah, that would be quite hilarious and like prototypical Oilers. But um, I would not be surprised. Like you look at when Arizona was terrible; like he'd face fifty shots a game and he'd be awesome. And any time that they'd actually perform better, he, he tend to, to perform worse. And I would not be shocked if going to Edmonton, he has a bounce back season himself, but that's more on his need to face a lot of shots. I don't think I'd be as high on the Talbot deal if it was a two- or three-year deal. I agree. But on one year to me, there's no risk to this. Well, plus with having so many good young goaltenders, like we don't know what Zagadulin's going to do. We don't know how Parsons going to respond after having a, a tough year. Gillies is still young despite being 25. Cause Keeps of our options open. So, like, if one of those guys tears the cover off the puck with, like Bennington did with St. Louis, well, you don't have to worry about Talbot occupying a spot and then, oh, how do we get rid of this guy? What If one of those guys plays that amazing where he steals a job, well – problem solved and you, now you have a good guy under contract for a long time for cheap and i'm not saying this is going to happen but as of right now july 4th riddick is not signed to the calgary flames he's yeah. a he's a free agent so it could get to the point where a deal doesn't get done he goes back to europe and now you're looking at say uh talbot gillies pairing yeah. so i think that either way the flames have given themselves flexibility like you said it buys us one year to help develop some of our young goalies again yeah but if you know if riddick gets hurt which we saw a couple of years ago even last year he got hurt he's pretty much been hurt every year he's been in calgary it gives us still a veteran backup and i feel much better going into the season with talbot in the let's call it one b slot than say a john gillies in the one b slot i think yeah i if, agree you know outside of st louis which is an anomaly with say bennington you don't go to the Stanley Cup Finals without experienced goaltending in this league. Generally, uh, unless you get like a guy like Matt Murray, but that's more like the team is awesome and the goalie is playing well despite being a rookie. And we have to remember, we still don't actually know what we have in David Riddick. He's played less than 100 NHL games. Well, and that's the case with all of our prospect goaltenders because they're all really young and inexperienced. Yeah. And goaltenders are voodoo. You don't really know what you got until they actually got. And that's why I like the Talbot deal because mm-hmm. if Riddick turns out not to be the guy I think they think he's going to be, I think Talbot can step in there and take that 1A duty quite easily. Yeah, and then you look around the league at other guys that were signed like Mrazek or uh, McElhenney or even Leonard. It, yeah, you might say you might have wanted Leonard over Talbot, but is the, the difference going to be that massive? I think right now if you were to bring in Leonard looking at the contract he got, You'd have to ask, who are you willing to get rid of to do that? And that's the point. Right, 2.75, we can find a way to fit that under the cap. Oh, yeah, easily. 
Um, should we talk about some of the other guys the Flames brought in? Definitely. Uh, Alan Quine got re-signed. One-year, two-way deal. I believe there's 700K. Uh, serviceable 13, 14 forward. And he looked good when the Flames brought him up this year. Yeah, he had that one uh, brain fart in the one game where he gave up, basically gave up a goal. But, but that's that, why you're an HL player, right? Exactly. But generally, you're going to be playing solid when you're called upon, and that's what you want from an extra forward. And I think he was one of the top, uh, I'd have to check exactly, but I believe he was one of the top points getters in uh, Stockton as well. So a guy that can be there to help mentor and elevate those young players. Exactly. The, no matter which way you look at it, it's a good signing. Uh, the next one that we have is uh, Brandon Davidson, another guy coming from Edmonton. Defenseman, one year, 700K two-way. I think that this guy could be the guy that probably replaces the defenseman we lost as that number seven. Uh, I'd even say he's more likely heading to Stockton to be like the captain of the team. More likely. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Looking it, looking it at who we've got down there, yeah. it, I think it's either him or Valiev who's going to be number seven. Yeah, it, it just depends. Uh, it also depends what kind of blue line movement we get this offseason. Yeah, that's uh, like I'm with all the rumors of TJ Brody getting traded for Cadre over the past week. I would be somewhat surprised if Brody or at least one of the defensemen that's currently on the team is with the team at, at training camp. So that'll probably move Shillington up into the ro regular rotation as well. And we'll see from there. And uh, the other two names, Byron Ferrosi. Uh, one year, 700K. Do you know where he played last year? Uh, no, I just remember that he was with the Leafs a while ago. And uh, Justin Kirkland. And again, those guys are pretty much the same as our Buddy Robinson and Alan Quine type yeah, depth. Exactly. They're depth guys for the A that if you need a quick call up, you can They're bring them They're not going to embarrass themselves. And th at that, that level, you're just wanting, like if you run into four or five injuries and you need a body, they're not going to embarrass themselves. They're not going to cost you a game. You're not going to have to shorten your bench too much. Yeah. They can just do a serviceable five, eight minutes, and who cares? As fans, we often like to call up the next young guy. Right? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, the Matthew Phillips, the Spencer Foos. But in a lot of ways, especially if they're only playing five minutes, it's better to call up one of these veteran seasoned guys yeah, to they, fill that they spot they and, leave the, and leave the you know prospect playing 12, 15, 20 minutes a night. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations where if the guy's hurt for like a month, then you'd probably defer to the younger guy because he's going to be playing for a while. Yeah. But if it's just for a game or two, it's better to not have any question of what you've got. Yeah, it's or as soon as they'll bring up a guy just for a road swing so they've got somebody. Yeah, exactly. And better to have that guy who's not – having much upside in his game and i think the thing we discount sometimes as fans not living in say a market like stockton where you see that team these guys all have some nhl experience to various degrees and you need that uh you've heard me use the phrase before the blind leading the blind you need guys with nhl experience to teach the other guys how to play that nhl game to give them that advice of you know what hey i was in the nhl you couldn't get away with that or whatever it might be so the more guys yeah, you can and have i think that has a lot to do with how uh the flames had difficulties in the 2000s with developing young players because they didn't most of the time their farm teams were all young guys and th nobody really knew how to elevate their games to push to that next level, and uh, that's why we've only had a handful of guys like Brandon Prust actually force themselves onto the team, where if the Flames had more of a structured environment, they might have had more of their players actually turn out for the better. And if you look at the teams that won the AHL Calder Cup, their you know, big trophy of the year, most of them are pretty veteran-laden teams. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, you're just like the NHL, the better teams are going to win. Well, let's talk about the Flames that left. Um, so far, those are all the Flames that have come in. Uh, leaving here, and we, we won't necessarily get a lot into these guys, but you and I both thought Oscar Fattenberg would probably leave. He goes just a little bit west to Vancouver, one year, 850K. We already talked about Mike Smith leaving for, Van, for Edmonton on a one-year, $2 million deal. Uh, the one that you probably want to chat a little bit about is your boy Garnet Hathaway left for Washington, four years, $6 million total, 1.5 a year. To me, I don't think the 1.5 was the issue with the Flames. I bet it was the term. And to me, like, uh, if Hathaway was willing to stay, 
I think that if it was me, I would have just bit the bullet and kept him even with the fourth year. Because if he, say he, he only plays roughly at his level for like the next three seasons and then starts to fade. Well, buying out the final year of his contract is going to hit you for what? Like 500000 I don't like that strategy. I don't like the whole I let's know, get them and buy them out. That's uh, I know. It's not the ideal strategy, but when you're dealing with a player that's that cheap, it's... But at the same time now, I look at it as an opportunity of, okay, Garnet's gone. Now we open a spot for Dylan Dubé or somebody else to come in and maybe play that role. Uh, I know, and that that's the problem is that the Flames were not very physical and like in the playoffs Hathaway was one of the three or four players that actually showed up frankly in the postseason and was effective during the postseason. And removing that and not really replacing him with anybody who has that same ability to impact the game. But how do we know they don't have that ability if we haven't tried them yet? I mean, going into that postseason, you wouldn't have thought Hathaway was going to be that guy either. I did, but... <laughs> but you're a big Hathaway fan. If yeah. you looked at the roster, yeah, I know. that's not well, the guy that you would have looked yeah, at. And well, said, you just generally look at um, teams that go far in the postseason. They generally have guys like Hathaway, and they, those players tend to be like the unsung heroes. Sort of like Devontae smith Pelly with Washington or Patrick Maroon with St. Louis this past season, where they're not your top guys. They're your fourth, third, fourth line guys. They're there to hit some people and chip in if they can. And Hathaway did that in the series against the Avalanche. And I think he would have been a key contributor to the Flames' postseason efforts moving forward. But unfortunately, Washington gets the benefit of it. I don't think in the modern NHL, especially as we saw this year with an uncertain salary cap, you can as much you like might like the player. I don't think you can really justify signing a a fourth line guy to a four year deal. I think you need more flexibility than that. We also never thought that Hathaway would make that team. I mean, he came in undrafted. He made his way up. What say that Lomberg or somebody else isn't that next guy to do oh, that? I agree. It's just that he's definitely going to be missed. But I think it opens a spot for someone. I to know, say, and that's where Treliving and the rest of the management staff has some work to cut out for them uh, to find a viable replacement for the energy that Hathaway brought. And like at the end of the day, is Hathaway replaceable? Oh, most definitely. It's just that when your one area of organizational weakness is passionate players who play a physical game and you lose arguably your best one, it kind of makes life a little bit more difficult because now you've got to find a suitable replacement for the guy that you just lost and then add something else on top of that and that's i think by christmas most of us i mean you're a, a hathaway fanboy i think most of us i don't want to say we've forgotten oh, about hathaway uh, but yeah. hathaway we won't as a be player, missing him. hathaway as a player is uh, he's it, not irreplaceable no and he's just a very good fourth liner. And, like, there are plenty of players throughout the league that are very good fourth liners. It's just that it's hard to to find players that excel in their respective roles, regardless of what those roles are. And Hathaway was one of the better fourth liners that have come around the Flames for a long time. And I think, too, knowing what he was as a player – you might get some players, even an Alan Quine or Brian Ferrosi or one of those guys who says, yeah, I can do that job. I'm willing to sort of change my game up a bit to do that job. So I, I think it'll be an easy position internally for the Flames to fill. And there's other guys that should be more physical than they are. I mean, even near the end of the year, we saw Sam Bennett fall into that role. So I think you can replace that physicality elsewhere. Oh, for sure. It's just the uh, it's not easy when you, you know especially because most teams around the league are looking for tougher guys that can actually play the game and that's where it's tough to lose someone who's actually good at that well let's jump on to these last two the next one as we talked about earlier curtis lazar uh the flames were still negotiating with him even after not qualifying him but he ends up in buffalo on a one-year one-way deal for 700k 
as much as you know that I like Lazar, I've been a Lazar supporter for a while. Now I look at this and go, wow, that was a waste of a second round pick. Yeah, and that's why I'm rarely ever in favor of trading draft picks unless you're getting a high quality forward or defenseman for those picks. Like, I was not offended by the Hamannick trade or the Hamilton trade because the Flames were getting already done. You know that they, these guys are talented individuals. You don't have to worry. There's no question marks. They're good. And they were both still young enough that you're going to get your value out of them. Exactly. And with Lazar, he was very disappointing in Ottawa. Like, came on hot and then faded. Lazar's it, a great example of why I always say you you can't rush a guy to the NHL. I need some NHL experience. Yeah, it, definitely. And I think he would have been basically Sam Bennett had he not been rushed. But that's not the case and i'm uh, i don't see lazar panning out to be more than a fill-in forward in much the li- lines of like quine or the like but we'll see and uh, you know good for him for getting a one-way deal with buffalo and hopefully he gets a good opportunity there but i think with a 32nd team coming in next year now the need for between vegas and seattle essentially you know, 30, 35, let's say, more players needing a job, I think he'll be in the league for a while. Yeah. I think he can definitely be a top, you know, 12 guy, just not in a playoff contending team like Calgary. And then the last one was Dalton Prout. Uh, We brought him in in the Eddie Lack deal. Played his first year in the AHL, was up here in the NHL last year. We didn't see too much of him, but he's going to San Jose. So He was serviceable. Uh, But again, he's a seventh forward defenseman. He did his job. Yeah, like there's nothing to complain about. He didn't stand out negatively. He wasn't like gross. But another or easy any of the, place to. Yeah, uh, the Flames have seven really good defensemen right now. Uh, eight actually. Um, so it, it's one of those that. Yeah, you'd like to keep them, but yeah. You know, I think with Dalton him. Prout, we like the person more than we like the player. Yeah, no, he was serviceable as like he's serviceable. Very, but how many guys are serviceable in that role? Like this is a role that I think is easily replaceable. Definitely. That's a journeyman position. Yeah, definitely. Like that's not a deal that you get lose any sleep over either way. No, um, and then a couple interesting signings I thought that we might want to chat about. Corey Perry goes to Dallas, one year, one point five. He's essentially making as much as Garnet Hathaway is. If Calgary could have got him for 1.5, I would have taken that deal. Oh, definitely. I don't know if there were conversations there or not, but yeah, um, I you think know, you it, just the thought of having like James Neal, Corey Perry, <laughs> and Matthew Kachuk on the same line, like you want to really annoy the opposition. <laughs> well, and even if if the Kadri deal would have gone through, if you had Kachuk, Kadri, Perry, yeah, it, it, it would have been fun. Yeah, w- and you know, especially with Peltier having that similar mentality. It's well, I think Perry would be done before Peltier ever gets here. Yeah. Oh, I know. But, you know, it just having more of that type of guy in the organization, those type, like the reason why those guys are so important is that uh, they're so competitive and their willingness to win is so great that they end up dragging the rest of their team with them at generally. And, like, you look at Brad Marchand, uh, being successful, going to the finals three times, uh, Perry going to the finals with the Ducks, winning a cup. Like, those guys tend to be more successful than necessarily their talent shows. And so Calgary would have been serviced well if they would have got him. But I, you know. And we heard Brad Treliving talk at the draft about how they're not so much looking for skill or size or anything. They're looking for compete level. And I think... Corey Perry could have been for this organization what they wanted Yermer Yager to be, that old mentor guy who comes in, who can work with some of the young guys, who could, I mean, not saying you would, but you could give him a letter and say you're one of the veterans in this room, and I think that could have done, at 1.5, great things for this team. Yeah. Can we call him Claude Lemieux and bring him back? You know, he would fit in right right good with Kachuk. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I think there's... I don't want to talk about that line until we see what happens. There's some balls in the air. Yeah. Um, and then the other one I wanted to point out was Keith Kincaid, who goes to Montreal on a one-year 1. 1.75. I think, honestly, if the Flames didn't have Zega Doolin, that might have been somewhere to play in, even as a 
experienced AHL guy. Um, I think I, I like Kincaid as a goalie. I think if we didn't get Talbot, that might have been the way to go. But with Zagadulin, we already don't have enough spots. You don't want to bring in somebody else. You're in agreement. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, let's uh, move away from July 1st. Here we are at Winsport for, I always called the rookie development camp, but I guess some of these guys technically aren't rookies. They're all NHL rookies for the prospect development camp. And this happens every year. Uh, the Flames bring in a bunch of their guys. I think for the first time this year compared to last year, um, a lot more guys under Flames contract, which is nice to see. And uh, we're here today on day one of the on ice. Different format for day one of the on ice today, Matt. We're used to seeing this look like a hockey practice. And, you know, they do a lot of hockey drills and that sort of thing. Today they were doing what I would call baselining. I can tell this team is trying to get into more numbers. They're trying to get, you know, analytical data. It was really cool to see. They had these lights set up on the ice for the first drill. Players skated by them. And based on the color the light turned, either green or red, they had to turn left or right. And it was all random. So the player has no idea what's going to happen. And it's seen, can the player, you know, move correctly through that? But even before they started the drill, they're all wearing these wristbands. It looks like, have you ever been to the rec room where you, you know, when you go to an arcade and you had to put coins in, now they have this thing you touch instead of putting coins in? It looks like that. And they touched it to this computer, and it knows who's going through the, I guess, the maze or the drill, so they can baseline those numbers, which is really cool. Yeah, and that's more what needs to be done in order to get advanced stats to be even more precise moving forward and i think i think we used to be in this era of let's bring in a bunch of scouts to look at guys and say i think i feel it in my bones this guy's going to be an nhl player well now we're relying more on computers and analytical data to say yeah. the numbers show this guy's trending upwards this way yeah and there's like uh, m myself personally like i use my own eyes like when i'm looking at players and all of that matt spies with his little eye a guy who can't skate very fast exactly um but uh you know because in my day job like i use my eyes in order to do my creative work because i'm an interior designer so you know y you there's I'm used to being able to nitpick things and it, you frequently for myself like what I'm seeing and like what numbers show tends to overlap so it's not but you also wouldn't walk into a room you want to design and say I think this is 120 square feet you'd pull out a measuring tape yeah even then you'd have a general gist but yeah but you're, you, you're gonna when pull you out actually measuring tape to yeah like when you're wanting to get down to the details you're gonna and we've seen guys who've had great numbers and never panned out. And we've seen guys like Rico Fata, who some scouts said, this is the guy to take first, yeah. and still didn't pan out. So I think the more you can have on the analytical side, the better decision yeah. you can make. And plus, like, a lot of that is trying to figure out, like, when you're drafting, like, what types of players actually turn out more frequently. And, like, it, that's one of the things, like, for a number of years, like, I was harping on is that, by drafting skill guys in later rounds, if they turn out, you're getting a legitimately good, like, top six forward, top four defenseman. Instead of, like, if you pick a physical guy who turns out, well, you have a very replaceable fourth line type, which, okay, you can just go sign that guy for a million and a half, like Hathaway. And well, trying to find, like, all those little market of inefficiencies, and I feel that... You know, like with them getting better with being able to nitpick things like uh, what we saw with the drills today, that helps to remove some of the ambiguity of the players. And I think they probably already got a lot of data on the players that are Flames property. You know, the Pedersons, the Roman, Kuzmonses, Godden, the guys that have been around here for a while. I think probably a lot of this is being used to also figure out what walk-on guys get invited back to main camp or play in that split squad rookie game. Like I think a lot of this is going to be let's evaluate ass assets we're not as familiar with yeah. and see you know who might be trending upwards or instead of just looking at a guy saying, wow, he hasn't skated in three months, but it looks like he's working hard this week. I think that's, if I was the organization, that's probably where I'd put more stock in some of those numbers. I think it's also great because these guys are going to go away and work with their power skating coaches and other coaches on their own, and now you have a tangible thing to bring back. Instead of saying, 
the team says I need to be faster. Well, here's the, you know, how long it took me to get across the rink, and here's what they expect the baseline to be. Now you have something tangible you can work towards. Yeah, and, and also, like, with being able to take video, which I'm assuming the Flames were doing, uh, you get to see, like, how they're skating in doing these drills and all of that, and you're able to nitpick, oh, your leg is moving this way when it should be moving that way, and that'll make you a little tiny bit faster and this and that. And, like, just getting really into the nitpickiness of the details to help all of these players improve. And that's what is needed from a development camp is to have, like, because all these players are raw. Like, there's no Gaudreau's or anything like that at this camp. So they have a lot of things that they need to work on. And having so many nitpicky things to work with, it'll help them move forward so that way they can be the best players that they can be on paper you're saying there's no good draws probably the best players here on paper would be godden and phillips uh, probably I the two guys with the most pro experience who have the most i pro would numbers. uh add uh, matthias emilio Pedersen to that okay because he was looking rather good in not the drills. not as much for us to talk about today in terms of on ice because it was a lot of these drills designed to baseline it, it sounds like we'll see more of a hockey practice tomorrow where you can have you and i can evaluate players but we saw group a first today uh anybody on group a really stand out to you, you mentioned Pedersen. why did you think Pedersen stood out uh he's very quick on his feet and it, it's not even so much the linear speed because there were a few players that had the same linear speed as he did, but it was like when he was moving through the pylons and that, and like the quickness of his judgment on when the light changes and all of those kind of things and how fast he turned and this and that, like everything was clean, precise. All of his footwork seemed like NHL ready. And, yeah, in I don't terms know of the footwork, not not the overall game. Like a, it, he was just a very fluid, skilled skater, and that's something that's different. Like usually, most players at these development camps are not as complete with their skating, and that's usually what the main thing they have to work on. And yet, with him, he looked like, in terms of his skating alone, looked like more like an NHL caliber player yeah one of the things i found interesting they did a drill i don't even know what you'd call it i'd almost call it like a puck control relay where they were taking a puck around pylons and at the end you had to make a really tight turn and i think he was one of the tightest turns there we saw some yeah. really crappy turns some guys falling on their butt so yeah i think he stood out uh in that sense for group a um another guy i really liked was josh nodler new flame here uh everybody that we drafted bought our second round pick uh, the Russian is here at camp. And I thought Nodler, for one of the younger players here, I thought that he stood out. He was working hard. Every time he was moving through, I thought, you know, there he was just noticeable. Like, you, you notice him doing the right things. And, again, limited viewing, but I just noticed him doing a lot of the right things. Again, not as explosive as, say, a Pedersen, but he had good control of the puck especially. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then after that, we saw Group B on the ice. Group B here tends to be the older group if we look at it, a lot more the, uh, you know, the older Flames prospects. Matson's in there, Zavagorodny, uh, Yellison, even Zagadulin. Um, from that older group, anybody that really stood out to you? Uh, Matthew Phillips, which you had mentioned. Which you have to, right? As a guy who's played a whole year in the HL, if you're not looking good against you know this yeah, team, and that's exactly what we used to say about guys like Culkin and Kulak. Yeah. That like, yeah, of course they're going to be better than guys like Anderson and Chillington when they were first drafted. And you know, it, it's he was the best player in the group B, but you know they, as expected if, if he wasn't then that would be the story mm -hmm. yeah and, and uh, you know to me the best but coming in as if i look at this on paper he's the guy I say yeah he should be the best mm -hmm. um peltier was there i think again tough to evaluate today where they're at because of the drills they're doing but peltier is going to be a guy i want to watch this week yeah he w looked all, all right from what i saw um he looked like a first year drafty decent like, you can tell her skill there, but it's very raw. One guy I had my eye on a little bit was uh, Carl Johan Lerby, who the Flames brought in from Malmo in the uh, European League. I don't know quite how old he is, but he's one of the older guys. It seemed like he, as we see with a lot of these Europeans, when we had 
uh, David Wolf come over and guys like that. He seemed like he was more getting adjusted to the um, North American ice today. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, even, you know, how fast he was skating, just some of his puck handling. I would imagine, too, and we often don't give enough credit, coming from Europe, probably battling a time change, battling an altitude change. Like, I think for a lot of these guys coming from Europe, there's more in play than we might be thinking of. Yeah. Especially, like, well, frankly, all of these players coming from the various places to Calgary, it's going to be a little bit t- yeah. tough. But I think for a lot of them in North America, you have at most, you know, a three-hour time difference. True. Some of these true, guys true, coming true. from Russia who are, you know, 11 to 14 hours difference, that's going to take a big toll on your body, especially when it's only for a week. Um, another guy that was interesting today that the Flames brought in last minute was Jeremy McKenna. Um, he's the line mate of Jacob Peltier in the QMJHL brought in last minute here. I'm, I'm not that excited to see McKenna in these drills. And there's other guys I'm going to be watching. I'm really interested to see what happens with McKenna in the scrimmage on Sunday. Cause I think they're going to put him. Remember last year we saw Dubé and Phillips on the same line in the scrimmage and they lit the thing up. I think you might see McKenna and uh, Peltier put on the same line. I think that could be the duo to watch there. Yeah. And, McKenna is trying to get a contract and he needs to show that not only in the scrimmage, which I'm assuming that he'll play well with Peltier, assuming they play together, but he needs to be able to show that he can be an awesome player in his own right, worthy of a contract. And we'll see. He looked all right. Like there was nothing really to complain about, but Again, these drills, it's extremely hard to gauge anything. Tomorrow should be a better day for them. Yeah. The other guys I'm really interested in seeing, and we didn't see them at all today, is the netminders. I think Nick, Sh- Nick Schneider and especially uh, Tyler Parsons, who are both pro goalies at this point, they ne- really need to, I wouldn't say in this camp, have a good showing because they already have a good job or they already have a job locked down. But I think that they are going to look good. And, you know, Parsons is saying he's feeling a lot better. I think this could be indicative of what we see from them this season. Yeah, they just need to show that, like, they're not regressing, really. Like, as long as, like, they, they're making the saves they should in the, the drills and in the scrimmage, that's fine. If you're going all Mason McDonald and letting every shot that over your glove in the net, well, then, yeah, there's a problem, but it's... And part of what I like about these camps is seeing these players off the ice, too. And I commented to you today, we talked to Nick Schneider, and I said, Nick is looking bigger. Like, just from, it's almost the Mark Jankowski thing. You and I used to come, and some years he was on the ice, some he wasn't. But every year we saw Mark fill out a little bit more. Yeah. It almost feels and like Schneider watching your kid grow like up. looks like an actual NHL caliber sized body yeah. now, instead of, like, the very thin, skinny player when he was first signed. And uh, Dustin Wolf is very much that very skinny scrawny looking guy he, he, and he's not as short as everybody's making it out to be he's about six foot six foot one uh, it, you know the, the whole like oh he's five ten thing that's overblown they he's didn't bring out the step stool for him in the scrum exactly we didn't have to adjust the tripods down we didn't have to bend everybody kneel with your microphones yes <laughs> exactly so yeah no they didn't make us do that um yeah, I think for me, one of the stories, I mean, a lot of the guys on here, we know who they are, yeah. right? It's going to be nice to see some of these draft picks, but none of them, I think, are anywhere near NHL for this year's draft picks. Even yeah. Peltier, I think, is the three years out. The only guy time. that I think is even remotely close from the guys on the list would be Matthew Phillips. And even then, that's more likely next year. Yeah, well, I mean, Phillips is already a pro, though, right? Yeah, we know what know. we, we have of him. That's literally the only one, though. That's and, it, and if the Flames have one spot, if you're going to replace Hathaway, you're probably going to put Dubé there over Phillips. Like, I oh, think, for sure. You know, none of these guys, there's nobody we're looking at here to say, wow, this guy could be an NHLer next year. So, to me, the big question is the goaltenders and and what they look like here and you know for the rest of the season yeah exactly and a lot of questions to be answered but you know this is day one of the development camp well matt why don't we sign off from day one and we'll come back with some updates from uh tomorrow yep and that'll be hopefully more interesting than what today's on ice was yeah, I don't know if I'd say more interesting, but I think a better evaluation That's of players. I, mean. I think today's interesting for how they did it. I mean, I was saying to you, I was fascinated by how does this wristband technology work? It's interesting in a development sense, but I think tomorrow we're going to get to see more of the hockey skills of these guys. Yes. So it was a lot about their decision-making and their hockey sense, as we'd say. Yes.
All right. Talk to you tomorrow, man. One of the highlights for us every development camp is getting to meet the newest Calgary Flames draft picks. Starting with the Flames' first round pick this year, number 26 overall, Jacob Peltier. Jacob was asked what his feeling was when he heard his name called by the Calgary Flames. Uh, you know, I, I think it's just awesome. Uh, I kind of blacked out though, so I don't remember a lot, but uh, you know, I'm just, just happy and proud right now. Jacob, for Flames fans that don't know you, how would you describe yourself as a player and the type of game you play? You know, I think I'm, I'm a small player who play big. Uh, I don't take a shift off. Uh, I think I, I can score goals and, and make some plays. I, I can play on, on both ends of, of the ice too. Jacob, are there any NHL players that you model your game after or think might be a good representation of the type of game you play? Uh, you know, I will say Brandon Gagger, or Braden Point. Uh, two guys, two, two small guys who play bigs and uh, can produce and play uh, on, on the defensive side too. Is there one or two things coming into this camp that you're really trying to work on in your game this summer? I want to be more solid in my skate. Uh, I want to work on my shot also to be more a threat for the opponent. Uh, yeah. Welcome to Calgary. Thank you. Congrats on being drafted by this organization. Yeah. You. Thank you. The next player we met was the Flames' fourth round pick, number 116 overall, Lucas Fuke. Lucas, first off, welcome to Calgary. Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, it's a great organization to be part of. Yeah, of course. As you're looking this summer, getting your game ready for next season, yeah. what's the biggest thing you're working on? Uh, at this camp now? Yeah, or all um, summer. The speed in the small areas, I think. Uh, I need it in the Swedish game and in here too. Uh, it's really important. As North Americans, I don't think we always understand the adjustment, but is it a big adjustment going from the big ice to the small ice? Yeah, this is the first time I was in a little rink in like 8 or 10 years, so it's really different and it's feel it at the training now. Uh, for people that don't know your game, uh, what type of player do you view yourself as? Uh, how much you compare it to? <sighs> My teammates said I was like Jamie Benn. Uh, yeah, like an offensive guy with some game and often uh, like a physical guy too, like in the middle, I think. And that's really what the Flames are looking for. I don't know if you remember Brian Burke, who was here a few years ago. He used the word truculence. Yeah. The guys who had truculence. And seeing some of your tape, that's what it seems like you have. Some of that truculence and that grit. Yeah, yeah. And it probably translates better in North America. Than yeah, it he's closer on everybody. So we think it's going to be good in North America too. Uh, with this camp uh, and coming to Calgary, uh, what has your experience been, really? Um, much stuff uh, from the meetings, from the eyes, from the like the off-eye sessions is really, really much to take in. Yeah. Favorite part of Calgary so far? I have like a salad bar in the town. I don't know its name, but it's, the Swedish tell me and we was there and okay. eat, so it was really good. Nice. I have not been so much in town yet. I have like a week after camp to see more. Cool. We'll enjoy it. Yeah. Welcome to the Flames organization. Thanks. Thanks. So we're here with Josh Nodler, a uh, new Flames draft pick. How does it feel to be part of the Flames organization? First oh, it's, it's unreal feeling. Um, it's a very professional organization. I'm so happy to be a part of it, and everything's been great so far. Uh, all the uh, development staff and, and equipment managers and all the coaches out there, been, they've been awesome, and uh, I'm just happy to get started. For new Flames fans who don't know you, how would you describe yourself as a player? Um, I'd say I'm a two-way centerman who, uh, who has a high hockey IQ and likes to make responsible and uh, good plays with the puck. I think I'm uh, really responsible on both ends, both offensively and defensively, and um, I, I'm pretty good at face-offs too, so that's how I describe myself. Just what we need around here. That's right. <laughs> uh, what do you feel that you need to improve in your game to take it to that next level? Sure, well I think uh, all areas of my game really have to improve, but I think uh, specifically is my skating. Uh, I think I need to keep improving my stride and keep improving my acceleration, getting, getting out of from start to stop, uh, improving my first three quick strides. Um, so, you know, as a player who's played at a lower level, Coming into this kind of training camp with some of the pros, are you finding that already you're learning something from those guys that maybe played some, you know, European men's hockey or the HL stuff? Sure. Yeah. Well, it's awesome to learn from these uh, these players who have lots of experience in pro and uh, in Europe and all and all things like that. So um, I'm just watching what they do and kind of and try to pick up little things each day and learn from them each and every day. Who are you rooming with during camp? Uh, I'm rooming with uh, Jacob. Uh, 
Peltier. Okay. Yeah. And have so. you guys been together before? No, we've never no? been together, but we're starting to get to know each other a little go. bit. Anything weird about Jacob you can tell so far? Uh, nothing weird, no. no just, like, uh, he's got sleeping. a pretty thick accent, no, but uh, yeah, he's a great kid cool. and uh, he's been having fun so far. Well, enjoy your time in Calgary. Enjoy the stampede. Thank you so we're much. happy yeah. to have you. And lastly, we talked to the Flames' seventh round pick, number 214 overall, the goaltender, Dustin Wolf. Dustin, one of the concerns many scouts had going into the entry draft was your size as a goaltender. Do you think that should be the conversation around you? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tougher as a goalie. Obviously, most guys want a 6'3 goalie or whatever, but um, I think it's just to the point where as long as you stop the pocket, I don't think it matters. So um, I just try to put, my, put myself in the best situation and I can to stop each and every shot that comes my way. So um, that's all I focus on. Dustin, for Flames fans not familiar with you or haven't seen you play, is there a goalie that you've modeled your game after? Uh, I mean, over time, I think it's kind of changed a bit. Um, once I relocated to Los Angeles when I was 10, it was all about Jonathan Quick and being flexible and explosive. But um, I think it's kind of changed a bit, and it's not necessarily one goaltender I try to focus on. It's uh, just a whole bunch. You try to pick and choose different elements from each goaltender that they're good at, and um, just try to replicate them. So um, I think one of the goalies right now that I think I pretty similar to is UC Soros just based on size and uh, he's had a pretty good start in Nashville. So. Growing up in California, excited to come play for a Canadian team in a different hockey market than California? Yeah, it's a little different. Obviously, um, I've played in the U.S. my whole life, so um, even in Everett, it's just over the just over the U.S. border, but um, awesome fans and awesome community, and um, I'm sure Calgary's even better than that. And here we are. It's Friday, which means it's day two of the Flames uh, 2019 development camp. And, Matt, we saw a more traditional look to the camp today. It looked like a hockey practice. Uh, had groups A and B on the ice. One thing I noticed last year with Kale McLean, who ran the camp, and again this year, it wasn't, as we saw a lot under Huska, a duplication of the same drills with both groups. He was doing some of the same, but there's also some drills that were very different between the two groups. So I think he's almost using this as a place to try out new drills before he goes back to Stockton. Yeah, that, that could very well be. And I am I think that what will likely end up happening is that the same drills will be done tomorrow, but with the other In reverse. Group. Yeah. Could be. Um, but it was definitely a different take with each of the groups, and it, it was interesting that there, there was – a, a few notable standouts today. One thing you were noticing today was uh, Dustin Wolf, Flames' seventh-round pick. A lot of the talk at the draft was that maybe he went late because of his size. Flames are listing him in the media guide at six foot. Arguably, he's probably about five eleven, but he did not look like a small man when he's in net today. No, uh, he, he. You can tell that he's shorter than Tyler Parsons, but not by a ton, and. He made a good deal of saves, and he looked very composed in the net. Not a lot of useless movement, and yet he would make very good desperation saves when they were called for. Uh, he looked very solid. I'm frankly at a loss for why he didn't get selected earlier, and he... The most direct comparison is UC Soros from Nashville, but uh, Wolf's a little bit taller than Soros, so you know um, if he follows the same trajectory, that may end up working well for the Flames. I was saying it to you this morning when we were watching him, and then when we were talking with Ryan Pike from Flames Nation, he was saying the same thing. But um, Wolf is a smaller guy, but he plays a big game in his net. He opens his body up. He knows how to cover a lot of his net. And you see some of these small guys who are, you know, bent over and they really sort of compress themselves in the net. But he, he likes to open up. I think Ryan compared him to Freddie Brathwaite. Yeah, and you think of, like, uh, Henrik Carlson from years has gone by where he was a very big guy, but yet he played very small in the net. Exactly. And he, he, with uh, Wolf, he plays very much the opposite where he cuts down angles effectively and he is smaller, but and there are things for shooters to shoot at, but he's also athletic enough where he can cover his mistakes. Yeah, I mean, back in the days, you probably remember, we had stand-up goalies and butterfly goalies, and the stand-up guys were like the Ron Hextalls who could do that well. You know, stay up, get big, cover a lot of the net. 
And I see some of those same tendencies in Wolf. Yeah, not necessarily to the same extent as those older style of goalies, but uh, he looks like a goalie that's just trying to stop the puck any way possible and while being composed enough not to get out of position while doing so. I think today, now again, this was hockey drills. It looked like a hockey practice. So there's only so much you can take away from it. But to me, the guys that were noticeable all day, Glenn Godden, Matthew Phillips, the guys that are second-year pros, right? The guys that have played in the HL for a year. You can tell those guys have pro experience. We talked yesterday about even Nick Schneider, who's looking, I think, markably better since last year. Um, you know, you can you can tell usually when you and I and you we talked about this morning, usually when we come here, there's one or two guys last year is Dubé who you're looking for to be head over he over, you know, head over heels better than everybody else. That huge leap because they're looking for an NHL job. I don't think there's anybody on this list of players that are here that are probably pushing for a full time NHL job this year, but you can definitely tell those guys have some pro experience. Yeah, and I would even add Matthew Phillips as someone who may not necessarily make the team out of training camp, but I would not be surprised if he plays some games in the NHL this season just because of the fact that he has shown some dynamic play both in terms of last season in Stockton and the latter half of the season, but also at this development camp. He has been perhaps the single best player here in terms of his overall talents. Yeah, and we'll talk with him later in this episode. We chatted with Matthew today after camp about just that, that he felt it took him sort of the first third of the season to get to his pro game, but now he feels he's settled into it. Um, you know, but looking at this list, I mean, we got guys like Ruzhishka who are probably going to go pro. Um, you know, some guys, Yellison, who will probably be a pro, but they're not that – I mean, they're looking good, but you can definitely tell Godden, Phillips, the guys have you know not only been here for a few years, but have an AHL year under their belt. Yeah, and like with some of the older European veterans that have been brought in, like they're having difficulties just due to the lack of size on the ice uh, because uh, you're going from an international size rank to – an NHL size rank. Lucas Folk was telling us about that today. Yeah, and it is a big adjustment because uh, you you just don't know exactly where you're supposed to be because the boards are so much closer to you. Yeah, I don't even know if it's not known where you need to be, but probably that anticipation too. The time it's going to take to get the puck to the guy across the ice is different. Mm-hmm. So you've got to sort of readjust your whole game. Yeah, plus angles, like if you're trying to clear the puck off the boards, all that kind of stuff, it's all different and it does take a, a time to adjust just where you're putting those pucks i think as north american fans we tend to think of it the opposite we think you're going from small ice to big ice there should be an adjustment i think since we downplay just how much the other way has an adjustment as well you can think well if you can play on the big ice you can play on the small ice but there is an adjustment going both ways and i think sometimes we don't we as north american fans think well it should be easy, right? You're going from bigger ice. Yeah, and like you're closer to the action all the time, and so you'd think that it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it is. Even and talking with Lucas with today, he called this the small ice. I'm thinking to myself while well, we're talking to him, wow, we just call this ice. Like, yeah. this is regular ice, and that's the big ice. Yeah. Um, and especially for Zagadulin, like it, uh, just knowing visually the where the shots are coming from, you get to be used to where certain shooters shoot on the international ice. And because of how compressed things are, they're, the shots are coming from completely different angles. So it makes his job of stopping pucks just that much more difficult. We talked to David Riddick about that a few years ago when he was here. And he said not even different angles, but the amount of time it takes for the puck to get, say, from the hash marks to the net is slightly different. And as a goalie, you just need to readjust that timing. Yeah, and that's why like when goalies come over, it always takes them a little bit of time to adjust. And we saw that with Riddick. He took a little while when he first got to Stockton where he wasn't looking very good. And then he turned it on after he did make those adjustments. And obviously now is like the 1A, 1B with the Flames. So, so Matt, looking at this roster, you and I always like to talk about walk-on players. And you were saying this to me earlier. There's usually that one walk-on player who really stands out, whether it's Spencer Fu, uh, you know, Juris, different guys we've yeah, seen over the years. Uh, guys that we don't necessarily sign like Burke a couple years ago. 
uh, who looked very good, but he just, with his lack of size, he didn't earn a contract. But guys like Juris and Hathaway, they w- look clearly above every one of the other walk-ons. And we're not really getting that this year. No. And when some of the defensemen are... Like, it's always harder to read the defensemen here because of the fact that it's not a game situation. And I think a lot of the drills they're doing are very offensively structured drills. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard, you know, like in past years, like when we've analyzed certain guys like Culkin or Kulak or Anderson or Shillington, you could tell, like, that they had competence in the offensive zone because of the fact that all the drills are more offensively based. But you didn't really get a good sense of their defensive awareness, not at least to the same extent, until the scrimmage. And I think that with the walk-on defensemen, you, we won't really get the full book on them until the scrimmage. But the, none of the walk-on players seem to stand out as, like, we must sign this guy. You and I have played a bit of a game in the past of figuring out who we think we'd sign then talking to Trill Living on the last day. And hearing him say, oh, we think we'll bring X guy or Y guy or Z guy back to main camp. So and far, it, usually those lists are identical. Well, and that's what we're trying to figure out or pretty close. I mean, there's yeah. been times where we're like, well, OK, I can see why maybe you don't want to bring this guy back or, you know, we have enough forwards, that sort of thing. Um, but this year, I mean, I could if I need it, if you said pick three guys, I could probably come up with three. I think there's just nobody that stands out to me. I guess the only guy I'd say maybe would be Jeremy McKenna, the right winger, simply because he has uh, a history with um, with Peltier. Yeah. A- and that's sort of like the – remember when we brought in, uh, what was it, Goudreau and Bill Arnold was his center in college? Yeah. Um, another player that he kind of has uh, stood out a bit is Montana Anabayuchi. Um, he's a right-handed defenseman. Uh, he's very tall uh, and a bit of an awkward skater, but he's very physical, and that was noticeable in some of the drills that he was hitting people left, right, and center. I, I don't know. Like uh, Again, it, we'd have to wait to see how he actually plays against forwards coming on him instead of just in the corners. But for the in-the-corners portion, he looked very good. He did, yeah. And so, I mean, there's not a ton of guys here, I think, you know, really not even a ton of guys. There's nobody really that I look at and say, yeah, we need this guy. Or we need to give this guy another look. So yeah. I can imagine it's just as difficult for the scouting right now. No, scouts have a lot more data than we do, and they have the data from yesterday that we talked about. But Yeah, so and additionally, like, video from all of these guys from their various Well, and they've plays. seen them in their regions too. Yeah, so they'll be a lot more informed than we are, but – like, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if the Flames do end up signing a defenseman or two from this camp just because they need some players for Stockton. But it, I don't know if you'll see anyone sign this year, but I can definitely see a couple of these guys invited back to main camp. Yeah, well, I'm also meaning, like, signed to, like, AHL-only deals potentially. It's yeah. sort of like what Garnett Hathaway was when we first signed him was an AHL-only deal, and then he earned an NHL deal. The guy who would hate to be in this camp is Christopher Rifak, the goaltender. Yeah. You're in a camp with Dustin Wolf, Tyler Parsons, Zagadulin and Schneider. Like they these are four goaltenders already in the system. It's gonna be tough to stand out. Yeah, among and those especially goals. with him like uh, the these drills not necessarily being typical drills. Like, it's hard for him to stand out one way or the other. Bold prediction right now, Tyler Parsons sits out for the scrimmage and it's uh Wolf and Rifak. It could be. I just think the Parsons has none to prove right now. Well, it depends on how the Flames feel. They, he, I, I could definitely see that, but it, it depends on both how he feels and if the Flames feel that he needs a... I think a him or Schneider will sit out, one of the two. But we'll see. So Matt, the other thing, and you were kind of mentioning this earlier, but you know we have these guys like Lurby, like Fook, coming over from Europe to play. And not only the big ice that we talked about, but you got to think about the altitude change, the time changes. Like a lot of these guys... If you really think about it, they've come to Calgary. It could be 11, 15 hours time difference. I can just imagine, and we I think we don't think about it at these camps, just how hard it can be for some of these guys to readjust to that. Yeah, they say that like it takes an, a day, like one day you can adjust one hour 
on your schedule. So like if you're on Stockton time here for five days and going home. Yeah, like it's not that big of a deal, but uh, for eleven hours time to zone difference, that that's a lot of time to make up so like so i'm just you know i just want to preface that so anyone who's watching footage whether ours or someone else's online from this and you're seeing some of these guys coming over from this from europe you know yellison guys like that just remember that there's a lot more going into this than just skating in july yeah um anything else from today that you wanted to to go through no the good players that we have in the system uh like uh peltier Phillips, Godin, uh, Patterson, they all look good. Like I was all really the impressed. players that basically you'd expect to look good look good. I was really impressed by Josh Nodler this morning. He yeah, was making here. some really hard shots in the first couple of shooting drills. Yeah, I agree. It, you can see why uh, some people think that like he has upper level upside, but uh, he likely has a few holes in his game that will take some time. But, you know, if he figures those things out, he could be a decent NHL caliber player down the road. I don't know if you were noticing this today, but I noticed, especially with Group B, who were on the ice for longer, um, you can definitely tell the guys who are sort of giving it their, let's call it their 100%, even if it's their July 100%, which might be their 70, throughout the whole ice time. Yeah. There's guys that were out there, they were doing whatever the coach asked, they were going hard the whole time. And there's other guys who seem to half ass to do some of the drills or who seem to sort of stop carrying halfway through. Um, we saw some guys who they were doing a board checking drill at one point, and if someone got close, they just dumped the puck because they didn't really want to get touched. You can sort of tell those guys, as Brad's talked about, the compete level of who's really doing what they're asked at full speed all the time versus who's going, ah, okay, it's July. Maybe I'll take it a little easy. Yeah, and that's you also mark and more those than skill. That's the important thing here. Yeah, and th- th- those are the type of things that you mark down in your list, and um, hopefully, you know, if they're walk-on players, that's not a good look at all. Um, you should like, especially if you don't have a contract, you should be putting people through the boards to like hey look at me i'm awesome yeah i mean you don't want to get hurt for your season but this isn't a time we're out to make names either no but you have to show enough effort where you know you're like good enough to earn a contract because like okay i can go do this to the opposition if you sign me and we saw some players kind of dogging it at certain points as you said so we'll see if that continues into tomorrow and Interesting notes from today, too, with Group A, they had a guest coach, which was uh, former Flame Matt Stajan, and Group B had a guest coach, which was former Flame Rhett Warner. So two guys that we're not sure if they're looking to get into the coaching ranks or just hanging out and looking for something to do on Stampede Parade Day that's away from the uh, you know, the parade route. But interesting to see those guys. In the past, we have seen in the scrimmage, it's been what, like Team McKinnis versus Team Neuendijk or Team McDonald versus Team McKinnis, that sort of thing. They often name yeah, those. Yeah, or Jelena versus Conroy. That's I right, yeah. I think year. last year was Jelena Conroy. And I've always wondered, like, how are we picking, you know, like we should be picking the guys whose banners are in the rafters. I would not be surprised this year. And we sort of heard rumblings today that it might be Team Stajan versus Team Warner. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't know, coming in, nothing against those two guys, but – Coming in here to a, a camp like this, do you really feel proud to play for Team Rhett Warner or Team Matt Stajan? Well, Warner will still throw you through the board, so you better do what he says. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we've always wondered who's going to be behind the bench. I wonder then if those two guys are behind the bench because it always seemed silly to me that we had Team Conroy with no Conroy. Yeah. Right? Team Jelena with no Jelena. It's. I know. I know that I'm probably overanalyzing it because it's training camp, but it almost be neat if those guys selected their teams at least. Yeah. You know, like it just seems like they're thrown together and they stick a name on them. And that point, just be white versus red or something like that. I agree. So, so but interesting to see uh, Stage back here. He still lives in the city, and probably a good way to you know get on the ice and um, may again maybe prepping for a coaching career somewhere down the road. Yeah, uh, it was nice to see Stage out there for sure. Well, Matt, I think that about wraps up day two. Yep. We, we will talk to you tomorrow after the last uh, day before the scrimmage. So our last chance to look at these guys sort of in skills-based drills. And, uh, and then we get to scrimmaging.
On ice day two here in the 2019 development camp, Dan and Matt here with Glenn Gunn. And this was your first pro year. You turned pro, you went to Stockton, played there. What did you learn about your game moving to the program? Uh, I learned a lot, actually. Um, obviously, that's a big jump coming from junior. So uh, every aspect of the game, I think you need to get uh, to that next level because you're up a, a level, right? So uh, for me, I think uh, the biggest thing was just holding on to the puck and uh, I mean, you're going against older guys, so I mean, you need to be able to protect the puck and be strong in the corner. So uh, that was a big area that I worked on, and the coaches helped me out a lot. How about off the ice? Anything you learned there? I mean, probably first time not living with a billet, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think uh, that was a big process. Obviously, setting that up. Uh, I was uh, living with Matthew Phillips, so okay. it was both our first time. So we got to go through that process together, which uh, was beneficial for both of us because we didn't know what really what we were doing at the start. But um, no, I think uh, obviously off ice was a big thing, and I mean going to pro. It's just uh, uh, time to grow up, really. Uh, with this being, like you being one of the few players with actual pro experience at this development camp, have other players been asking you for advice or you know pointers or tips or anything? Yeah, like uh, I think the guys, uh, the older guys that will probably be there next year uh, coming out of junior, uh, they got a lot of questions. Same with me last year. I mean, I was asking uh, all the guys, Fu, Manji, all those guys, what it's like. And uh, mostly, I think it's a lot of off ice, kind of where should we live and uh, what's good areas, things to eat and stuff like that. So uh, just little tips that, I mean, uh, I can help them as much as I can. Uh, what do you feel that you have to improve in your game to get to the NHL? Uh, I think a lot, but mostly uh, I think skating. Obviously, uh, NHL is a fast game, and I think uh, if you can get that speed, uh, you can create a lot more. So for me, that's been a big emphasis, and uh, I'm going to continue to work on that. Some new coaches down in Stockton this year. You worked with Kale McLean and his staff. Yeah. What can you tell us about Kale as a coach? Uh, he was great. Uh, obviously, it was, I think it was his first year being the head coach in, uh, in the American League, so uh, I think he handled it pretty well. Obviously, we had uh, Joe Sorella, uh, who's been around. Uh, obviously, he's... I think a thousand any shell game, yeah, so Joe's, he knows what. Joe's a season guy. Yeah, it's a definitely season, and uh, Dominic Pittis, who obviously uh, I think everyone knows what he brings, so uh, it's, it's great. So for Kale, I think uh, he had a good supporting staff, and uh, I mean I enjoyed that year a lot. So off the ice here, what are you looking forward to in your trip to Calgary this summer? Um, obviously uh, we're training out at Edge, so uh, I'm excited to work over there with those guys, and uh, they got a few pros over there, but. If not, just enjoy the city. You I mean, guys are going horseback riding this year? Yeah, I think that's uh, tomorrow. So yeah. hopefully the weather clears up for us to be able to I do that. It's, it's going to suck uh, it's raining. Yeah, and we did uh, a bowling uh, yesterday too, which is pretty cool. And cool. Uh, Yeah, they got a pretty good schedule set up for us. What's the biggest thing you're working on this summer in your game before coming to main camp? Uh, I think just like I said, I mean, that, that skating. I think uh, obviously there's a lot of areas that I want to work on, but that's been a big focus for me. And um, I mean, work on some skills too. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. So we're here at Matthew Phillips. Uh, Matthew, you played a full season of pro this past season. Um, what was the biggest transition from the junior game to the pro game for you in that season? Yeah, um, I mean, it's obviously a, a, a big jump in a lot of ways, but personally I found it was just the speed. Uh, things just happen a lot quicker, and you need to make your plays quicker and quicker decisions, and um, if you don't do that, then you don't really have any time with the puck, so that's a big thing for you. And did you feel like you were able to compete okay at that AHL level? What's the biggest thing you think you have to work on to continue that pro journey? Yeah, um, I mean, it took a little while, um, but I mean, near the kind of one-third way point through the season, I, I found my game, and um, I, I found I could make a difference out there, and, and that was really encouraging, so um, I think I just kind of need to keep working on my skating. Uh, I think once I have that time and space, I, I feel really comfortable and confident with the puck, but it's just getting that space. Weird that you and Glenn were rooming together this year? Yeah, it was yeah. fun. Uh, we were kind of the only two rookies at the start there, so kind of a no-brainer, but it was it was a different experience, and he was a good roomie. And, I mean, for someone turning pro, you're probably, for, for the first time, not living with billets, not having the same curfews. Mm -hmm. Some of that off-ice stuff, that must take some adjustment time as well. Yeah, big time. Um, it's something that not a lot of people go through, kind of having that much responsibility on your own shoulders um, when you're 20 years old, but... I came along just like everything else and got the hang of it. Uh, so with this camp, uh, have people been asking you questions and advice? Like, because you're obviously one of the leaders in this camp. Mm -hmm. so, uh, how have the, the, all the new walk-on guys and new draft picks been treating you? Yeah, uh, yeah, they've been kind of leaning on me a little bit. Um, I, I feel like I'm pretty open to questions and helping the guys out. Um, I'm really confident with everything and, and all the staff and everyone. And, I can put myself in their shoes a couple years ago, so it's uh, it's helpful. So looking to you know crack that NHL spot with the Calgary Flames, what do you think has to is the biggest change that's been made to your game to get to that next level? Yeah, uh, I think a big thing is just kind of consistency. Um, 
I think my effort was there all year, but um, just making a difference every game and being an impact player, uh, I think that's kind of how you get noticed and, and get the bump up to the NHL. And now that you can settle down in your second pro year, you know what's expected of you, that'll probably help as well. Yeah, uh, less nerves, and, and I think I can just kind of focus on, on my game and, and details that I can do to get better, and, and I kind of know what it takes now. Are you staying in Calgary after the camp? Yeah, I'm from here. I'm here all summer. So Yeah, yeah I wasn't sure if you were staying. I know you're from here. So yeah, around. yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm here all you're summer. You're one of the few that doesn't try to get out of here for standing. <laughs> no, no. Typical Calgary. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what was it like uh, adjusting to living in the States and in Stockton? Yeah, uh, it's different. Um, I mean, I, I was pretty spoiled coming from Victoria for three years doesn't get much better than that um but it was different to Stockton's a big change. yeah big jump uh, I still got spoiled with the weather though so that was nice but I mean a different country uh, a long ways from home can be pretty intimidating but uh, I definitely helped having Glenn with me thanks Matthew yeah. well it's Saturday the third day of on ice here at uh Flames 2019 development camp and Matt I think if we look at today it was more of a traditional hockey practice which if any parents are listening know not a lot to see when you're going to hockey practice, especially for the kids. Um, to me, today was the story of the goaltenders. We haven't seen a lot of them this week, but they all got tested quite a bit today. Yeah, and it was nice to see them facing more realistic shots, and rebound opportunities, and plays in close to where the shooters are trying to beat them. And even this morning, Sigler was making them go on their knees and slide across the net. So just trying to get the goalies more engaged in more scenarios they may see in a game. Yeah, and the, to their credit, most of them looked really good during the various drills, so that that's always nice to see. There, there was no clear weak goaltender like we have usually see. Cough, Mason McDonald coughed. Yeah, I feel bad for the walk-on guy, this uh, refac. Yeah. Because when you're on the ice, as we, and we mentioned this earlier, with Zagadulin, Schneider, Parsons, Wolf, you know that there's also Gillies in the system. This guy's not got a hope at you know probably getting the contract. Yeah, and it's one of those where it's probably a build the relationship. He had really good uh, stats in the Alsen scan in Sweden, uh, 194 goals against, 929 save percentage. So he was one of the better young goalies over in Sweden. So if the Flames can build a relationship and if he goes and repeats that this year, then he might be worth a contract, especially because you got to figure that Gillies is either going to get promoted to being the backup for next season or he's not going to be in the organization. Yeah, even then, I can't see this guy coming over to be an ECHL guy, which even yeah. if Gillies gets promoted next year, I think you've still got Zagadul and Schneider there. Yeah, so we'll see. It's That's one of those where it may just be a relationship builder for next year. Outside of that, though, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, there's really no guys here that are wowing you and you watch them. And we've got guys like Pelletier who, while a first-round pick, still looks like a junior hockey player. Um, we've got some of the pros like Phillips and Godden, guys that have turned pro, but there's nobody here that, I don't know about you, that I'm looking at going, wow, this guy is amazing to watch, or we can already see the talent who's now to this player. Yeah, like, there's nobody that's imminently knocking at the door that they're going to be in the NHL to start the season. And like in past years, we've had guys like Kachuk and Bennett and all of those type of guys where it was readily apparent that they were – Close to or NHL caliber. Or even a couple of years ago when we had um, uh, Yusuf Valamaki here and he was telling us in our media scrums, I'm going to make this team. And it gave us an interesting storyline, see if he did or not. Like the stories just aren't there. Yeah. And like there's only really one player here that I could see even playing a game in the NHL this season, and that would be Matthew Phillips. And that's if he has a really good year in the AHL and the Flames run into injury troubles in the back half and then he might get a recall. Beyond that, like, there's nobody here that's knocking at the door at all. And you look at the forward prospects, uh, Glenn Godden, he looks all right. And if he makes the NHL, he'll, he'll be in the mold of, like, a Derek Ryan fourth line physical guy. Uh, not anything more really than that. Um, and two other higher-end talents are uh, Matthias Emilio Patterson and uh, Jacob Peltier. And both of those guys, I feel, 
viewing them and comparing them to guys from the past that they too will probably eventually reach the NHL but that's like two three four years from now not anywhere near in the near term talking to GM Brad Drew living earlier today he was saying you know you're seeing these guys and guys like you were saying Peltier and uh, Zavagor Rodney and Lindstrom guys we've seen for a number of years said they're getting bigger this year you and I mentioned that earlier with Nick Schneider they're bigger. They're looking more like men. They're putting on weight. It sounds to me, and while Brad didn't specifically say it, I'm kind of getting it as, you know what, we're moving the ball forward this year. Everybody's progressing the way you expect them to progress. They're getting bigger. They're working on their skills. This is just another year of skill development for a lot of these guys. Yeah, and you look at this camp in and, and contrast to years gone by where you had guys regressing, like Patrick Sealoff as an example he seemed to like hit the ceiling and then started trending down the wrong way and we're not seeing that with any of the returning prospects they are all improved based on where they were this time last year if it's not on ice at least physically yeah and even on ice i'd say like they're slightly better like you know that they might not be leaps and bounds better but they've improved and That's not to say that they're all trending towards being NHL talent. It's just that they've got, they're going in the right direction. And that's all you can hope for and hope that continues to happen with each passing year that they might eventually work their way up into an NHL caliber talent. Right now, very few have even the tools, it seems, to be that. But, you know, that can change over time. You and I were chatting with some fans today during the uh, A group on ice. And they were saying that there's really nobody here that's really that impressive looking. And when I've broken down that comment in my head, I think as fans, we often look at guys sort of being impressive who we know something about. And if we look at this team, the Flames, just because of the situation of our draft picks in the last couple of years and other things like that, we have a lot of guys who are playing U.S. hockey, which as Canadians, we don't get to see. U.S. college hockey, I should say. Or they're playing in Europe, which, again, we don't get to see. If you look at the number of players here that, as a, I would say, a sort of Flames fan, you might have access to watching, either in person or on video. You've really only got a handful of guys, um, Peltier included in that, who are playing in the Canadian League, the Canadian Hockey League, that you might have any idea of who they are. Yeah, and it's like uh, last year the Flames selected uh, Mitchell Matson. And basically everybody's like, um, who is that? And like now we're able to see him in this development camp and he's more of a physical type forward. But if you've never had the opportunity to watch the USHL games that he played, which being in Calgary, yeah, right, you can't really get access to them it's virtually impossible to get any sort of read or bond with that player because to most fans it's just a name on a page like oh we selected this guy in the fifth round and yeah so it's sort of the few ahl players you know your Gordon phillips uh guys like peltier who we see here or we can get access to i think there's a lot of interesting players who like we said are moving forward they just do it where we don't see them, right? Mm-hmm. A- and this is our once a year to catch up, to touch base, to see how they're doing. We try to do some of that here on the show for you guys. But even outside of that, just looking at how these prospects have progressed over last year. And I think, mm-hmm. well, yeah, people are right. There's not a lot of exciting names. We don't have the Spencer Fu. We don't have the use of Valamaki. You know, I think probably the biggest name, if you will, is Tyler Parsons in this group. There's a lot of good hockey players that are progressing forward here. Yeah, like it's not like this group is completely devoid of talent. Like it, 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 there are plenty of skilled forwards and defensemen, and especially goaltenders. It's just that, it, to use a baseball term, it's like most of the Flames prospects are an A ball, and you know you don't really get to know them until they're in AAA or you know starting to emerge onto the major league roster. And, you know, it's one of those where there's a lot of talent, but nobody really knows who these people are. And even Yellison and Zega Doolin, like, these guys don't speak English. They're here at camp. They have a translator for the two because they don't speak English. Like, you know, as Flames fans, we've heard these names come from Russia, 
But as fans, we have yet to see what they do on North American ice. So I, I would just, I guess I'm bringing this up because I'm suggesting that fans don't discount uh, this year's camp because there's not the big name or the name you've heard of or the, you know, the Dylan Dubé who you think is going to make the team this year. There's still a lot of good Flames prospects here. I agree. And speaking of Zagadulin, uh, he he, uh, was instructed through his translator, uh, the coach's instructions for the drills, and it was rather simple. If the puck's coming at you, stop it. (laughs) Hopefully you don't even have to tell him that. I mean, as a goaltender, oh, wait, that's my job? Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) You know, uh, but it's – and we even saw – it's actually interesting you mentioned that. They had the Group B goaltenders on the ice before practice today. And Jordan Siglet was giving verbal instructions to the other two goaltenders, but he then had to get down on his knees and show Zagadulin what he wanted done. So it's it's something that I think as a coach, too, you've really got to think about how you're communicating with those players. Yeah, and it's definitely a different challenge, especially because of the fact the Flames, uh, they haven't really had very many Russians in their organization for a number of years, so... Uh, like you could have almost have like some other players help out if need be like if it was one of the Swedish players was having difficulties we have like nine different Swedes in the organization so you could just go through that route but uh, it's interesting you mentioned that too because I think in the past even guys like Michael Backlund and guys like that they've been sort of the anomaly If if there's a Calgary Flames prospect that hasn't been a North American born guy it's almost been this weird phenomenon. But if you look at the roster here, I mean, there's probably three Swedish guys who are going to become pros after this next season. we got a couple Russians. I think this camp, more than others, as far as the Flames signed prospects, has more international flavor to me than a lot of the others. Yeah, and that's you can go the route that the Flames have been going where it's primarily Canadian and U.S. players, but you're limiting yourself by not – with just opportunities and especially not having first round picks and second round picks to the extent that the flames have had they really need to try and draw on talent from wherever they can find it and luckily they've been able to get some decent depth round picks like Zavgrovny, uh, Pedersen and the like where you're getting high value for lower round picks. One thing I will say in sort of credit to the Flames this year is there's been how many years now you and I have come here waiting to find the the latest European free agent, whether it was David Wolf, whether it was David Riddick, and saying, what the heck have we got here? For me this year, looking at Yellison, Lurby, Zagadulin, those are really the three names that are here that we brought over as uh, as you know European free agents. I think for the first time that I can remember one of these camps, I like all the European free agents. Yeah, and each one stands out as being competent at a bare minimum at their specific job. And like Zagadulin, uh, his movements in the crease are very composed and there's not a lot of excess movement, which that uh, the last goalie that I saw that had that particular uh, tick at uh, development camp was David Riddick. And it'll be interesting to see, especially as he adapts to the AHL and ECHL, uh, can he translate his abilities? Because he has the size and apparently, based on July hockey, some measure of talent as a goaltender, he may develop into something more than just a filler guy. Yeah, I mean, there's been times you and I have been here, and David Wolf stands out to me as an example. Um, Chervenka, another example. Guys that you and I have seen come over from Europe to these camps. And we've sat here in July. And, uh, again, July hockey is maybe not the best time to judge, but you and I have sat here watching saying, uh, this is not going to work out. Yeah. And I think this is the first year I'm looking at all the guys, even in Riddick's year. I, I'd have to go back and look, but I know there's a couple other free agents there. And we said – you know what, this Riddick goalie probably good enough to play somewhere in the system. None of us looked at it and said, wow, this guy's starter material. Yeah. But this is the first year I can't think of any one of the signed European free agents I'm looking at going, eh, maybe this is going to be a waste of one of the 50 contracts. Yeah. So, and that's a positive, and hopefully 
things progress and especially with calgary being one of the elite teams the flames ended up getting some of the best european free agents which that typically isn't the case usually you're just getting uh, guys like uh, last year with uh the, the one guy uh yasin elise who was you know good for the german olympic team and then was that was it and that's more typical of what you expect is just somebody who's a body who can play. It, well, but this and time if I remember, part ones. of the Ali's issue was he did, he thought he was too good for the AHL. Yeah. We won't dissect that too much because we don't know what was in his head, but looking at the roster on paper, I don't know why he thought he would have made the NHL team. Yeah, true enough. Um, Matt, I ask you this every time we talk while well, we're here at Winsport. Um, any walk-on guys that – or any non-signed Flames prospects that really stood out to you today? Well, I can't really comment too in-depth on the defenseman walk-ons because it... Very it, offensive-minded drills today. Yeah, the, the drills are all offensive-minded. You have to wait until the scrimmage where you're actually seeing how they cope with the players rushing in on them in order to be able to get a better metric of who they are and like there's some guys that are physical and that's great and some that have decent shots and that's great but you don't really you can't really judge the defensemen from these type of drills you need to see them in game action and i think and you and i mentioned this last year um some of the defensemen were made to look foolish because we had some really good players here last year. Like we saw Dubé and Phillips in that scrimmage who just made the defense look silly, especially some of the walk-on guys. I think the talent level between the walk-ons and some of the prospects this year is very minute. And so I don't think you're going to see any, I shouldn't say any, I don't think you'll see as many guys who there's this divide between the walk-ons and the prospect guys. I think we saw it a bit last year too because there were so many walk-ons that line was more blurred. Yeah. And that you're going to have a better gauge at where they are. And like, if they're getting beat by players that are here, like they were last year, then that's more of a reflection of these guys aren't particularly good. What about forwards? Anyone that look good to you? Uh, amongst the walk-ons, nobody really, really stood out. Like, there's a, a couple guys again that are physical forwards, like Fighting. He's physical, but at the end of the day, am I, am I seeing a Garnett Hathaway or a Josh Juris or somebody more offensively gifted than that? No. I think right now the Flames have enough forwards into their system in the AHL, ECHL. I think you'd really have to be a special guy coming out of this to get a Flames contract, uh, even if it's going to be an HL contract. Now, how many of these guys get invited to camp is yet to be seen. I don't think uh, we need – I mean, last year they had a ton of them because they were running two training camps. They ran one here and one in China. Yeah, and plus, like, this year we're not doing And we're not doing the rookie tournament. In tournament. And I think we're just doing the one game against the, the Oilers prospects. In That's the split squad in Red Deer, I think, yeah. Yeah, and – so like that is yeah uh, there's and we not should have enough need. guys for that yeah i could see some of these guys potentially getting invited to stockton camp as an ahl thing but i just looking at this list today the only guy maybe because he was here last year is ben freeman they've looked at him for a couple of years but there's nobody that's really standing out to me saying wow we need another look at this guy or we need to tie this guy up so nobody else can have him Mm-hmm. You know, and those are the two reasons you would bring that guy to camp. I'm looking at these guys. You know what? A lot of these guys just seem like it's bodies to fill the ice. Yeah, room. it's like when we saw Josh Juris, like the first day of the development camp, his first year, you knew right away that he was not a normal walk-on. And, like, he, you, he stood out, and it's like, who is this guy? Oh, okay, I need to know this guy's name because he looks clearly better. And it was the same with Garnett Hathaway where – yeah, this guy looks more like an NHL caliber prospect than all of the rest of the guys. We're just not seeing anything that makes you jump for joy at all. But I don't think we're also seeing the lower end as much as we have in other no, years. We're not seeing we're the not guy seeing who's a, clearly a, going, yeah, like how did this Penner, guy get invited? Yeah. yeah, like Lyndon Penner that one year. Where like, it's like, yeah, there's some wow, guys here, like, here. okay, how did this guy get invited? Whose neighbor is this guy to be able to get here? Yeah. I think everybody that's here looks like 
they're all about the same even you know i'd sort of give them an even ranking it's the nhl prospects and it's this one bucket of other body yeah and that's about where yeah i there's no like this guy might be good enough maybe to be an echl player there's nobody in that group it's like mostly just if you needed bodies at the a like that's basically what and even then with the number of free agents still available I think I, if I was the GM, I'd be more likely to go shopping through those guys than I would to call these walk-ons. True enough. Uh, like I would more rather see guys like Kirby Reichel or the uh, insert name here of that type of equivalent guy that's just a veteran, solid player instead of one of these walk-ons. Well, even, even not even a veteran necessarily, but a guy who's played some pro North American hockey for a couple of years. Well, Matt, I think from us, uh, before we sign off, I just say if anyone disagrees with us, if you were here this week and you saw one of the walk-ons, you think well, the Flames have to have this guy, let us know. Tweet us. Uh, let us know on Facebook. Let us know in the comments on the website. But if you think we're wrong, let us know because we'd, we'd love to really know if there's someone out there that maybe we're missing. Yeah, debate's always good. Uh, Matt, anything else for today? No, just looking forward to tomorrow's scrimmage, and that way we can get a better read on the defenseman because that's the thing I'm most curious about and have been all week because of the lack of defensemen in the organization that maybe we might be able to find one or two that could fit. And so tomorrow will be, I think, the better gauge for all of those types. Yeah, not just defensemen, but, I mean, in a practice, your forwards' movements are very controlled, and we're seeing them do a lot of passing, a lot of shooting, Things we're not seeing a lot of is positioning and thinking the game. And, well, you can only get so, so much of that from an hour and a half of, you know, scrimmaging. Um, I always find in that scrimmage, even for the forwards, we can say, okay, who's really in position? Who's out of position a lot? Who's a step behind? So it's just a, it's a better, I think, indication for all the players. So, Matt, we will uh, touch base with you again tomorrow after the scrimmage. So we're here with uh, Luke Phillip. Luke, you've had a bit of a non-traditional route to where you are now, going through the dub, playing for a powerhouse in the U of A. Um, what did you find was the biggest transition in your game from playing in the dub to going to university hockey? Um, I don't think I transition style it's all that much. Um, it's, a, it's definitely a small, uh, shorter schedule. You don't play nearly as many games, so it's... Uh, you kind of got to be up for those games. I mean, not saying you don't in the Western League, but you kind of get into more of a playing routine. So um, I don't think I changed anything style-wise with my game. I think, um, yeah, it's just a result of playing with better players all the time in the U of A. What are you majoring in? I was in business economics and business law. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Good yeah. school for that. Yeah. Um, coming into you know a camp like this and looking to turn pro this year, what are your off-season goals to get your game to that next level? Um, lower body strength, um, skating, you know, getting up and down the ice. Everything happens faster in pro. Um, you can see it out there. It's a good pace out there. Um, you know, I feel good. That was a goal of mine, you know, starting in the gym in the summer. Um, I want to get stronger down low, down low in my lo lower body and then working with uh, the skating coach um, with the Flames throughout the summer and continue to improve that so I feel you know the best I can come come camp I feel like um, yeah little tweaks offensively here and there but I think the main aspect is kind of that lower body and that skating and you know strength on pucks in the pro uh, level. With uh, the Flames having Derek Ryan it, he kind of his career kind of went in a similar trajectory where he had to go through university hockey um, has he reached out with you at all or do you take any inspiration on his journey to becoming a very fairly key cog in the yeah of course I do yeah he was uh, a guy that our GM Stan Marple at the U of A talked about a lot and uh, uh, we know he came through the system and I've met him he's worked out with us a little bit with uh, at the edge in um, in Calgary we got a workout group going there and he's he's an awesome guy he's uh, you know we've had a few chats about the U of A and uh, about uh, his time there versus my time so it's it's pretty awesome to see you know the route he took he went uh, he ended up going to Europe for a little bit but yeah. nonetheless has came back and is playing pretty well for the Flames right now. For Flames fans who aren't as familiar with you not having seen a lot of tape of you know U of A um, how would you describe your game or what player do you try to model yourself after? Um, I think I well, I'm a centerman I'm you know strong in the face-off circle I've 
move advance the puck well throughout the neutral zone. Um, I'm good and tight with uh, making short, small plays and see, have good vision down low, see the ice, can find the open man. So uh, kind of that's my, I think, biggest strengths offensively. In conversation with the Flames' seventh-round pick from 2017, Phillips Venningson. So here we are, day three of the on-ice training here for the Flames. Philip, you've been here a few times now as a prospect. What if, you're one of the senior guys here. Um, have you have you found anything different this year as opposed to your last runs here in Calgary, development camp? Uh, not really. It's you know some different like activities outside the ice and like new guys and but the staff same like. I know a couple of guys since the past years, and you know, you, you become more comfortable each year, and, and that's that's really good. You're going back for one more year uh, playing in Europe. Yeah. Um, after that, we'll see maybe you'll turn pro in North America. Now, what's the biggest thing you're trying to work on this summer? Um, like, obviously, everybody want to get fast and strong, and I think that's what I want to be too. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of my weapons is my skating ability, and. I still want to want to have that ability to, you know, have a yeah, like a chance against the bigger guys in yeah SHL this year, and I also think I I want to like develop my my shooting ability, like get the puck off quick from the blade, and, you know, so like all the small details, like usual stuff, fast and strong. So. You find it a good challenge for yourself at your age to be playing in the SHL against some of the significantly older players? Uh, I think it's a. I had a good year last year. Uh, I think that was really good for me to, you know, feel to to play against men and like first year pro. And I think I'm I'm ready to to take the next. Help that the transition. Yeah. For sure. yeah. Are you look? What are you looking forward to for this upcoming season? Uh, what uh, are you looking? I'm uh, looking forward to see if I, like, if I'm good enough to, to produce on SHL level. Like, I know I can do it. Like, could do it in Allsvenskan, and, and I want to prove like the staff here and the staff in Sweden that you know I, I can do that. So that's kind of the main thing. And you know, you're, we're a new team in new league, so you know, we, obviously we're gonna have a, like, a hard time, of course. But you know, we gotta make the best of it. And you know. I think so as North American fans, we tend to discount it, but how much of a difference is it for you coming here and playing on the smaller ice? When you're out, you don't think of it too much, but obviously you can, like, sometimes you can notice in, like, in the corners you have less time and you have to do, like, right on your back, and so you have, have to make a, a quick decision. And, uh, but, like... I think that's kind of the big difference. Like in Are the you corners. staying in Calgary at all after camp or heading right home? Um, I'm staying a few days. I've been here for, uh, I was been here since 22nd June. So practicing with the guys like Alan and, and the off-ice work and stuff. So yeah, I kind of, uh, we'll see uh, when we have some time over. Uh, I hope so, uh, you know, watch around, like look around in the city and stuff. And another one of the 2017 draft class, Adam Rzyszka, drafted in the fourth round and will be turning pro, expected to head to the Stockton Heat. So Adam, this isn't your first uh, development camp for the Flames. Yeah. Coming in after last season, what's the big thing you're trying to work on this summer? Uh, just uh, just being more explosive, you know, and uh, uh, just be more agile, probably, and uh, just work on overall strength, you know, it's uh, just like every summer we do. How do, you, how do you feel your game has improved over this past season? Uh, I've been more consistent with my uh, with my hockey, and uh, I've grown, uh, you know, a lot, and uh, as of mentally and physically, uh, which is which is good. I'm turning pro now, so uh, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, we'll see about that jump. Anything you think, you know, b- between now and the time you play your first pro game, that really needs to change in the game, or just steady progression? Just the progression, you know. I, it's just I just need to be consistent with what I do every single day, and uh, and uh, as the coaches and staff are going to help me to to be uh, successful in uh, pro hockey. And being one of the older guys here at camp, any advice you've given to the new guys? Not really. Just enjoy it, you know. Just have fun and uh, just learn uh, learn everything you can from uh, from the from the coaches, from everybody around you. So there, we have a lot of we have a lot of guys around here. So uh, just ask questions and uh, just learn, you know. 
Thank are you. you liking the differences uh, with the new setup that they're having at, at the development camp instead of like last year? I mean, it's not that different, but uh, we did the testing last year too uh, on, on ice. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I feel like it's the same. You know, it's. Uh, uh, it's just the people around. You know, it makes you comfortable and. Uh, and uh, makes you feel like uh, you've been here quite a while, so it doesn't really feel like it's been changing for me. Thanks, Adam. And our last interview from this year comes from the 2018 sixth round draft pick, Matthias Emilio Pedersen. So, uh, last day of development camp here for 2019. You look great in the scrimmage today. Thank you. Um, you've had the experience of taking a little bit different route than a lot of guys here, going USHL to uh, NCAA. What was the biggest difference you noticed in the game uh, you had to play between the USHL and the NCAA? Uh, probably the physicality and the speed of the game. Um, you know, you're playing against older guys. Uh, you're going from, you know, 20-year-olds to 25-year-olds pretty quickly. And uh, I think that's a big step for a lot of guys. And uh, I would say just the physicality and the speed. 30, 30 points in 40 games at the NCAA, pretty good numbers. Mm -hmm. For Flames fans that haven't seen a lot of you, it's hard for us to get co U.S. college yeah. games here. How would you describe your game? Um, I'd say a playmaker. Um, I got a lot of speed. Um, like to take the D-men D wide and, uh, you know, make plays. Uh, also like to slow the game down a little bit for my teammates and try to find areas where you don't necessarily have to go full speed every time. But find ways to open up the game and uh, yeah. Valuable skills in today's NHL. Yeah, exactly. Over the past couple of years your game seems to have really exploded. Yeah. What do you feel that caused that change? Um, I think a lot of it is me being comfortable with myself on the ice. I thought you know I've been a little maybe grip my stick a little too hard um, and that's a couple of things that I worked on in the summer. I had a mental, mental coach um, over the past two years now um, and I really found it beneficial coming into this year and I kind of thought about like you know how can I visualize myself being better and it kind of helped help my game and uh, I started visualizing before every game and you know it's a little a little secret but um, that's kind of the stuff I'm doing. Really cool. Between now and the start of camp for Denver yeah uh, what's the biggest things you're gonna be working on? Um, my shot, I think, uh, getting it off quick, um, getting some, I guess, a heavier shot. I think I have a quick release, but, um, you know, if I can put more pucks in the net this year, uh, I'd be really happy with that. And you staying in Calgary after this, going home? I'm staying in Calgary for another five days. Nice. And uh, then I'll go home after that. Going on the stampede? No. <laughs> Well, I'll uh, take care of my body a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh, what do you feel that you have to improve from where you are now to eventually making the NHL down the road? Um, I think I'm a bit ways. Um, you know, I have to put a couple pounds on and uh, become a little stronger. Um, but I feel like, you know, I put my best foot forward here every every time I'm here, I feel like, and at least I try to. And, um, you know, that's all I can do. And keep working the way I have been and uh, even harder uh, and we'll see we'll see where it takes me shootout or a game like this today with the shootouts on it good chance for you to showcase your skills for the fans for the uh, coaching staff as you know every year this place is packed with flames fans um, we saw what you did but you're on the ice with these guys was there anybody that really stood out to you today um I thought um, uh, I thought Svenningson looked good um, Nodler, uh, quick, quick hands. Uh, played on my line for a little bit, and I thought, thought he was making plays all over the ice. Uh, easy to see that when you're playing with them, but uh, I'm sure there was a lot of other guys that had a couple of good plays. But I thought Nodler and Phillips were two really quick players out there. Any thoughts on the goaltenders you faced today? They were good. They were good goalies. Some uh, really good goalies in this camp. Big, big goalies that you know they can stop the puck, especially in the Russian kid there. Um, he's a big boy. And, likes to play the puck eventually. Well, that's another development camp in the books. The 2019 Dev Camp has come to an end. And as always, we ended the last day, in this case day four, with an on-ice scrimmage. And kind of a, I don't know, from our perspective, seemed a little unorganized. They're supposed to be Team Rhett Warner versus Team Matt Stage and neither guy to be found. So we'll just call them red and white because we have no idea which one's supposed to be Stage and which one's supposed to be Warner. 
So, Matt, I'll read out the scores, and you can tell us at the end who won, Team Stager or Team Warner. Okay. Um, from Team Red during the regular, so the way they did is they ran two 10-minute segments. Um, they did played five on five, four on four, three on three, then did a shootout, brought the Zamboni back, and lathered, rinsed, and repeated all over. First goal today for Team Red came from walk-on player Tommy Miller. Uh, second goal from also for Red – uh, from Robert Hamilton, so two walk-on guys. Third goal today for Team Red from uh, Lucas Fuke. Then we had, I don't even know how to say the guy's name, Montana Onibushi, another walk-on guy. Lots of walk-on score today. Yeah. Um, that was also, that was the first white goal, so it was 3-1 to one at that point. Then Philip Svenningson scored for white to make it 3-2. Uh, to two. Then Dimitri Kuzmontsis, who had a really good day today, uh, scored for White to make it 4-2. to two. And that was a very much a highlight reel caliber goal, and that we'll be posting in the video online. And then we had uh, Jacob Peltier score for White to make it 3-4. to four. And lastly was uh, Luke Philippe. So it was a 4-4 tie. In the shootouts... Um, Red ran away with that shootout. Yeah, it was, I think, 6-1 or something like that for Red in total. Yeah, 6. I don't even think White got a goal. Yeah, 6-zip. So the shootout scorers were Milos Roman, um, Dimitri Kuzmanses, Patterson. Patterson. I'm trying to match up jersey numbers to our list here. Uh, Emilio Patterson. Um... Andrew Nielsen, not a guy we expect to score. And then the second half was Martin Pospisil and Zach Gutari. Yeah, uh, Pospisil's goal, he uh, brought back the old Jason Allison move of skate in and then just rip a wicked slap shot right into the top corner. And so if you're interested in watching this scrimmage today, we will have it on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to YouTube and look up Fireside Chat or... 2019 Calgary Flames development scrimmage. We'll have it there. You can also go to firesidechat.ca and click on the link in the header to go to YouTube. We've also, by the time you listen to this, posted a few times on all our social media channels. So links are out there. Um, if you can't find it, let us know. Tweet us, Facebook us, email us. We'll make sure you get the link. But we have the full scrimmage and the shootouts today for you to watch at your convenience um, whenever you want to if you're interested in seeing that. So, Matt, with that in mind, we had talked uh, yesterday about how we're probably going to use this as our real judge of some of these players. And I think for me, the big thing that stood out, probably the most evenly matched, even though the scores don't show necessarily, evenly matched shootout we've seen. As we've talked about all week, there's really nobody here that we're looking at going, wow, there's our Dylan Dubé or our you know, Garnet Hathaway, the guy who we know is NHL bound at the end of the year. Even the walk-on guys here, they – most of them didn't seem that out of place. Yeah, it was a nice, refreshing take on things where you're n not looking at a whole cast of people and going, okay, yeah, they just found the guy from around the corner type of thing that, hey, we need a body. This and guy plays do. in Red Deer. He's close by. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, hey, you'll do because we just need some numbers. But this time it was everybody was legitimately decent. And even most of the goals we read actually seem to have come from walk-on players. Yeah, and like on our previous days, uh, uh, talk about the defensemen walk-ons. We were looking specifically for anybody who was notably good or bad, and nobody really stood out as being terrible. I would say all the defensemen looked bad today. Yeah, like, but no one individually no. looked. And no one line. Like, I think last year, I'd have to go back and listen uh, to last year's show, Dubé Dube got a, yeah, yeah, they got like a hat trick. Yeah. They were just lighting it up out there. Yeah, and uh, there was a couple isolated plays that were really good, like Pedersen and Kuzmansi's basically were noticeable pretty much every time they were on the ice. But the rest of the teams, it, it was very scattershot. One line I did like today, I thought it was kind of interesting. They had uh, Matthew Phillips and uh, Jacob Peltier on a line together. And I think they were trying to rekindle the magic of Dubé and Phillips. 
Yeah, it could be. They they seem to work pretty well. But I think the biggest story of today for me overall with everybody was, and Brad Treliving says this to us every year, but it was July hockey, and it looked like July hockey. It looked, in a lot of ways, like a beer league game. There was a bunch of missed passes. There were guys trying to pass rink wide. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, it, it wasn't the most flowing style of game, but it wasn't bad either. It just it, you're dealing with a bunch of players that more, more than likely will not reach the NHL. It's what you expect from a so, July scrimmage. Yeah. Um, one couple guys here I had on my list that looked really good today. Uh, we mentioned Emilio Pedersen looked really good. Um, I also thought Demetrius Kuzmontis looked good. And from the walk-ons, the only guy that I really saw and said, wow, this guy looked, I thought was playing hard all game, was in the right spot, was number 90, Ronnie Hine. Yeah. Um, so those were my three uh, players that I thought stood out today. Now, before we put too much stock in this game, we have to remind everybody what Trilliving says to us every year and said to us last year when we talked to him too. Nobody makes the team in July. Nobody loses a spot in July. It's come out. Show us what you got. They're meeting with all the players one-on-one right now, the coaching staff, the GM, to give them all a summer plan. Here's what you need to do before either we see you again in September or, you know, you go back to your other team wherever you're going in September. But nobody's going to earn a spot in July. So with that in mind, we can keep talking about what we've seen this week. But, again, it's not going to lose anyone that roster spot. Yeah, it's more just uh, checking them out to make sure that they're on the right path and if any course corrections need to be made, awesome. If not, awesome. And for the new guys like Fuke, like, um, you know, uh, uh, Yellison, Zagadulin, even Peltier guys knew the organization. It's just meeting the staff. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And – it's just one of those things that like especially like what we try to do is just gauge like what these players are you know because most people don't have a frame of reference with them and so you know just saying oh like say Pedersen he's a shifty player and good stick handler so that way you can kind of understand like the next time you actually are able to see him that oh well he's that kind of generic archetype instead of like a power forward type or whatever and mostly like there's a few really good players mostly not so much but you know it, it's just a any fun, surprises for you time. there was i was actually surprised by Pedersen. i knew that he was decent but he to me he was the biggest change from last year he was good last year. Like you could see flashes of the skill, but like I think he, going to U Denver, they've got a good hockey program yeah, there. He looks like a player that will be in the NHL at some point in the future because he there's just too much dynamic skill there, and usually anybody who has that level of dynamic skill and is fast tends to make the NHL. Yeah, like, I'm even though it might not necessarily like he will turn into like a top forward or anything like that. Usually those guys get a crack just because of the, that's basically checking all the marks that you're looking for for a prospect. Is he fast? Is he a good stick handler? This, that, the next thing, and he does check all the marks. I'm looking forward to seeing him turn pro. I think we'll see him in Stockton first, but I think you know seeing his pro game either way is going to be exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he has long for Stockton <laughs> if once he gets there. We'll see. There's been a, There's been times we've had college standouts that haven't translated well. I even look at a Bill Arnold, Yeah. right? So, you know, just because you're doing well in college doesn't necessarily mean you're going to translate to pro. Yeah, true enough. Um, one guy that actually when we talked to Pedersen today that he mentioned as a guy that he was a little surprised with was Josh Nodler, number 84, uh, one of the Flames picks this year. He said Nodler's got good hands. And you and I talked about Nodler earlier in the week. Um, I, I, I've i noticed Josh doing good things all week, and I think – it's too early to have a book on this guy and know we've got there, but it's always nice when those new guys come in and are making an immediate impact. Yeah, especially because like it, with not having any video whatsoever uh, available, period, uh, it's hard to see who the player is. And so like we were both coming into this camp with both Fuke and Nodler being completely ignorant of what they were. 
and his abilities are top notch. It's just uh, you have to see because, like, uh, upon reading up more about him, was his lack of consistency from game to game. But his skill level is there, and like, if he had that, that consistency, he probably would have been a top two round pick. But if you know the consistency isn't there, then that's why we got him in the fifth. It's interesting talking to Pedersen today. He was talking about how he's been using a mental coach for the last couple of years to help him get better at some of the mental side of the game. And I don't know if that would help with consistency. I've never heard of a guy having a mental coach before. Um, like, I don't know. A lot of things are things you can train, right? You can train better skating. You can train better shooting. How do you train better consistency? Oh, well, it's, it's one of those things that it just it's in the person and if you can find a way to work around uh yourself then you can improve and you know like i take myself as an example like it, when i was in school i was the perpetually lazy student uh because growing up i'd give zero effort and get top marks because you know it is what it is and I had to train how I would think and approach things to work around that. And I'm still fundamentally a lazy person who works like 18 hours a day practically. That's so why you haven't been drafted. Too yes. lazy, not consistent yeah. enough. Yeah. I think this year, too, another story for me today, and I don't know about what you thought, but of the goaltenders here, all of them except for Dustin Wolf, have played professional hockey against men. Um, and I think this was the year that we really didn't see. Often in the past, there's been one goalie who stood out as being weaker than the others. Even Refalk, the walk-on guy, looked good today. And I think I think it was harder to score this year because there wasn't the one goalie you could light up. Yeah, like in the past, and I'm going to be rude. Mason McDonald. Yeah, uh, saying that, you know, everybody had Mason McDonald to shoot on. And so, this oh, is why easy get goal. Qualified, Matt. Yes, easy goals. Come come here, come there. You know, the red light will be on for you. And A friend <laughs> of ours came to watch the scrimmage with us today, and first question is, where's the tall guy? Yeah. Didn't well, get qualified. Yeah, and this time the, the goalies were all very solid. And, and even Wolf. Wolf didn't look out of place with those pro goalies. Yeah, which was rather impressive. He was the worst of the goalies, I thought. But that's also understandable because yeah. he's by far the youngest of all of them and like has the least experience. They swapped goalies a lot more today than usual. And often I didn't even know when a goalie swap had been made because often in the past it would be you swapped goalies. It's like, okay, you might as well have not had one in net at this point. Yeah, it's going, oh, Tyler Parsons or Gillies is in net. That, that team has a chance of stopping the puck. Then in comes Mason McDonald and four goals later. Well, even <laughs> to, to his – his credit, Nick Schneider improved a lot over last year, yeah, but even last year, Schneider, if I remember correctly, got lit up the last couple yeah, of years. Um, the one guy that did impress me, though, is Zega Doolin. We hadn't seen him before this camp. He looks, you mentioned yesterday and uh, in previous recaps, some of his poise in net, but he, I think he was probably the best-looking goaltender today. He looked big in the net. He was cutting off angles. He, I was Put really it impressed. This, way, this is one of those players where if you were saying like this was the regular camp and like he was vying for the backup spot in the NHL, you'd be going, hmm, that's a possibility. Not necessarily going to win it, but you know, there's not very many things he needs to correct in his game. He's just very solid and composed, made lots of decent saves. Needs to learn English. Yeah, needs to learn English, but, you know, you're a goalie. It's like, oh, the shooter's coming at me. I better stop that. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, you can't be part of an NHL team with a translator for very long. Yeah, I know. Well, that doesn't take very long if you have to really have to get it done. And we have to remember, back when David Riddick first came to camp, he looked awful, too. I mean, I remember you and I sitting in the crowd, and it was reminded today from a friend of ours as well that he looked awful. But I remember you and I sitting there going, really? Well, like even last preseason, uh, that was that 7-2 game against the you Oilers. You and I went to that Oilers game. And it's like, um, okay, what are we going to do for a backup now? And Riddick, of course, had yeah. the season he did. So. Well, I remember talking to you after that one. It's like, okay, uh, maybe Gillies will be the, the guy this year. But So I'm just I'm bringing these things up because, you know, we know where Riddick is now, but he looked terrible his first camp. So we could have Zagadulin come in looking great and fizzle out as well. But 
It's going to be interesting. Yeah, goalies are basically voodoo. You don't really know what they're going to do for you. And yes. It's an interesting problem to have for the Flames now, though. I count four AHL caliber goaltenders. I count uh, Zagadulin, Parsons, Gillies, and I'll throw Schneider in there. Um, it, the AHL's got a lot of two games and, you know, back to backs or three in a row or three games and four nights type situations where you need two, go- two guys. So. I think we could get away with putting Schneider in the E for one more year if we need to, set him down in Kansas City. But you don't – I mean, we think it's bad when teams run three goalies. You're not going to run four goalies. No, and that's where – like I would not be surprised over the summer if one was dealt in a bigger trade. Uh, like it, it's sort of like that TJ Brody rumored deal uh, for Kadri that – you know, maybe something along those lines where he get like Gillies or something gets added as the filler for that. Yeah, and that's why I'm bringing it up because the Flames obviously have to make a move. I mean, we know that Talbot, we know that Riddick or the NHL pairing, there's nowhere to go up there this year. But, you know, we're not going to run three or four goalies in the A. So, and you're not going to send Zaga Doolin or Parsons or Gillies down to the ECHL. So, short of loaning them out. Um, a move has to be made. And I think that'll be probably the next time you and I talk is discussing, you know, something's going on, right? Yeah. I mean, we and know Brad's trying. I would trying. not entirely be shocked if they did start the season with Zagadulin and Schneider in the E, but I don't think that sort of like McDonald last year, but I don't see that being a long-term ish consideration and i think that over the course of the season that will all get ferreted out if it is i think if i was starting the season i'd start zagadulin up just that he can sort of learn a little bit more about the north american game maybe have you know a little bit more travel with the team it's going to be a very different lifestyle in north america um but i i'll be honest i don't think one of our goalies will probably be traded till camp there's so much going on right now with the cap and with different teams and that sort of thing that I think it's going to take to camp for somebody to realize, okay, we need to fill this spot. Let's go get it from Calgary. Sort of like we saw Brett Kulak a couple years ago trade right after camp. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it'll be something similar. So, Matt, any clo- anybody disappoint today? Uh, not, camp? not really. Like, there was – like, all of all the returning players, they all were progressing in a linear way. Like, there was nobody that – like Patrick Seal off a couple of years ago where he looked good and then he fell off the face of the earth. Mason was, McDonald. Uh, Mason McDonald kind of was bad the entire time. Uh, he turned pro and he still didn't look any better. Yeah. Uh, but, no, there was nobody who kind of, like, fell off a cliff or regressed. Like it, 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 Some guys progressed. They might have progressed yeah. a little bit uh, only. But, yeah, some but, guys probably made bigger leaps than other guys, but everyone's moving forward. Yeah. And, of course, you'd like to see everybody make the big leaps. Like, guys like, say, Svenningson and uh, Lindstrom, they progressed a little bit. Like, I didn't see a huge leap in either yeah. of their games. But you could see that they're better than last. For sure. And whether that – the next time we see them next year or at training camp, if they haven't really made another leap forward, then you're kind of pigeonholing them as being, like, an AHL-only forward. But – that's you know we have to, have to wait and see I, I think for me the big thing this year is there's not a lot of our guys turning pro no in the past we've seen a, a good handful of our guys turning pro and it, this year it's really going to be the story of you know yellison lurby zagadulin these guys were bringing in from europe to fill that pro rank and i think we're almost in a holding pattern because of that we really can't evaluate some of these guys moving forward until they turn pro and next year is going to be another big year for the flames with a lot of their prospects turning pro yeah it's just one of those odd things where the flames had so many of their prospects actually hit the mark and are now in the nhl that like normally you graduate a few players a year but we've had so many guys jump up and like right into the nhl we've had a lot of defensemen our well, four Dubé, core Dubé Manjapani. That's two. Two of twelve. I wouldn't say it's a lot. N- yeah, but we right? didn't really have a ton of forwards because other no. guys like K- Kachuk and all that. But even if you look at the HL team, I mean there's not a lot of guys there that are probably going to be NHL, you know, caliber. No. So I think the big thing is 
we've drafted a lot of NCAA players, and they have longer eligibilities. We can't just turn them pro anytime we want to. We have more guys from Europe. So next year, I think, will be a big year for us to really evaluate guys turning pro and how much their game's improved. Oh. It's hard to... It's really hard to do that, you know, year by year when you're playing in the dub or in the O. You can look at numbers, but it's still the same level of hockey. And I think that's, to me, the, the story is going to be those European guys. Any closing thoughts from uh, development camp? Uh, just once again, looking forward to the remainder of the off season, seeing what tweaks to the team will be made and get getting ready for training camp and hopefully a repeat of the regular season anyway. I think that, you know, if there's anything resembling what happened in the playoffs again next year, then, yeah, <laughs> that will be a interesting conversation. So we'll be looking for a new GM. Yeah, I th- I think, yeah, top to bottom. <laughs> no more Boston Pizza Jr. No. Um, yeah, I think between now and the next time you and I talk, which probably be September, I think the Flames have to do something as far as cap. I think they've got to move some players out. I just don't know what they're going to be able to do. And my worry between now and then is, are they going to get the deal done they need to? I mean, I think the Kadri deal made a lot of sense. I don't know how many dance partners there are. And with a lot of good free agents still on the market, not t- you know really high level, but middle six free, free agents, I think that's indicative that there's not a lot of money to go around right now. So I don't think you're going to say trade Brody for picks or prospects you're gonna have to take equal money in a deal and i think that's what might handcuff the flames a bit yeah and there are certain teams that could use defensemen like brody and like montreal or winnipeg and you know a deal involving say nick ehlers from winnipeg that might be an interesting thing i don't know if winnipeg wants to decimate their roster anymore well, they, they have too many forwards. And Even a guy like Froelich, who I thought might get dealt for picks, I think at the NHL, the way it is right now, you're going to have to trade money for money, and I think that might be a little scary for the Flames. Yeah. I, I would be somewhat surprised if they did that, unless they could uh, do get that accomplished before the secondary buyout window, and depending on the contract. Like, if it's a one-year yeah. one deal, then... Yeah, I mean, Froelich's got a couple left. And I don't think he's buyout worthy, but I just think that they were yeah. looking to dump some money in the off season. Yeah, and I, I just don't think it's going to be possible right now. Yeah, and with Froelich and Stone, that like frankly, the Flames can get by easily without either of those players, and that's seven million dollars tied up. So that's what I mean, right? We're going to have to dump at least one of those deals. Yeah. But I just don't know in the NHL who's got the cap room to take that on for picks right now. Yeah. And that's where like looking around the league and seeing uh, how things shake out with the remaining remaining free agents. Like there are teams out there that are just going to need some NHL caliber bodies. So Ottawa, uh, that Ottawa. Yeah. Hey, this is Stone. We got him back. <laughs> Don't pay attention to the fact he's on the blue line. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, when we traded um, with Vancouver. We traded them Granlund. What? There's two Granlunds? Yes. We can pull the same stunt. That's right. We have a player named M. Stone. Would you like him? Yes. So, yeah, I, ju- I just think that's going to be the hardest thing for the Flames right now. Is I think it's easy to move player for player like a... You know what? What was the rumor deal with Toronto? It was um, Kadri and uh, Kadri and Brown. Yeah, for Jankowski and Brody. And if you look at that, it's equal bodies, e- pretty equal money. Those are the kind of deals you're going to get done between now and September. I think if we're trying to shed salary, it's going to be a tough thing to do. Yeah, and the Flames have other areas of need, so it, it you know, like with having four young defensemen that are all under the age of 22 in the nhl we can get away with having one of the veteran guys depart and we do need another top six forward so you know brody is the most viable of the three to get traded so it's one of those situations where uh, if you're going to trade somebody that is the way to go it's just I'm going to give you my prediction. It's going to be the opposite of what we usually say. I think that trade's going to take place later rather than sooner. I don't yeah. think you'll see at this point, I think, with the draft and July 1st out of the way, 
I think a lot of teams are going to be waiting till closer to camp until I mean I don't think the Flames want to do anything until they know what Kachuk's number is going to be, uh, what you know uh, Riddick's number is going to be. I think there's a lot of teams in a similar boat to us, and I don't think you're going to see a big move made until everyone's got their internal business done. And I think it'll be late August, early September before we see that big trade happen. Yeah, I agree. And the Flames will just have to be patient. And yeah. well, I don't think the Flames care. I think it's the Sea of Red that cares. We're yeah. all, you know, we want the deal done as fans. As long as the guy is there on the ice for the season, I don't think the Flames organization cares when the trade oh, happens. Oh, no. Uh, as long as we got the team set, it's all good. And. Yeah, and if the Flames have to carry Brody Stone and for a leak into the season, is that the end of the world? Not really. Well, it depends on the cap implications. If you have to carry one of those guys and say you might lose a you know another player that you wanted or need or can't get that top six forward, that's where the issue is. It's yeah, not the player sure themselves. Enough. It's the with the the short the smaller cap increase than we expected. I have no problem with those guys being Flames. My issue is what does that money hinder us from doing? True enough. Right. If you, if you had all those guys at a million bucks, you'd carry them all day. Yeah. But if we have to pay four, three and a half million for what might be a number seven defenseman, what's that hindering? Sure enough. So, all right, Matt. Well, we'll sign off from here at Winsport, um, from the Jones Snyder Arena, and we'll talk to you probably again before training camp opens. Yeah. And once again, thank you for all the work that by the people behind the scenes for the Calgary Flames. They always put on a good. They always put on a good camp. Yeah, and thank you for listening, and have a good summer. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.